Declining ratings of the first run of Futurama led not to its cancellation, but a simple non-renewal of the contract from Fox. Despite its popularity and a dedicated fanbase, it wasn't keeping up with the other shows on the network. And yet, it was this fanbase that made it a poor decision to drop it in the first place, something already picked up on by other networks, such as Adult Swim. Cartoon Network was looking for something to promote the expansion of its Adult Swim block, and Futurama was chosen as something with a strong core audience that could retain ratings. Ratings that it got. Eventually resulting in Comedy Central making a bid to air the reruns of the original run after Cartoon Network's contract ended. During these negotiations, however, Fox floated the idea that Comedy Central could not only run reruns, but could produce new episodes as well, something Fox themselves weren't interested in doing. And there was some talk of making a few direct-to-video movies. When Comedy Central offered to produce 16 episodes, this idea was expanded to four movies that could be divided into four episodes each, fulfilling both arms of this desire, despite how confusing a format this could be. And so, a show that went out with a whimper was able to come back with also a whimper. Promoting a series of direct-to-DVD movies as a return for a beloved show on a new network was a hard sell, especially with these episodes airing so far apart, months between one semi-conclusion that wasn't a full conclusion, and the next. Of course, in retrospective, we know that this format didn't actually harm the show's return as much as it could have, and Futurama's future on Comedy Central was a bright one. This retrospective will cover the second life that Futurama ever lived, covering the next three seasons as they aired on its new home network of Comedy Central. I will be covering individual episodes one by one, with each episode's retrospective being split into three parts, recap, review, and wrap-up, though this format varies with the format of the show itself. Recap is for a general detailing of the episode as a whole, and why this video has brief in the title. Review is about the episode in the context of the show at large, and wrap-up is anything I couldn't find another place for. Lastly, Futurama is a show with many adult themes, including and involving the following topics. Violence, substance abuse, racism, sexism, talking dogs, and trauma. And while I make an attempt to sanitize my language for an easier viewing experience, I will not be straying away from these topics when they appear in the show. As such, viewer discretion is advised. Bender's Big Score After a fake-out about being cancelled by the Box Network, the Planet Express crew is sent on a mission to the nude beach planet Sans Hermes, who lost his head and wife in a limbo accident. While there, it's discovered that Fry has a Bender tattoo on his butt, as well as the crew being scammed by a group of aliens who take over, first, their personal information, and later the entire company. While Hermes' head is being treated in anticipation of reattachment, Leela meets Lars, a man working in the head museum who immediately starts to flirt with her before the two fall in love. The scammer aliens then enter Planet Express and begin to search for valuable information, discovering that the tattoo on Fry's butt actually has the secret to time travel hidden inside of it. In spite of the warnings of Nibbler, the aliens begin to abuse this one-way, paradox-correcting portal to send a brainwashed Bender back in time with the intention of having him steal various valuable goods and then waiting underneath the Planet Express building for the intervening years. Once all of history's valuables are in their possession and they've bought out most of the Earth, the scammer aliens attempt to erase Fry from history so that his ass tattoo cannot be used to destroy the universe, their universe, and Fry uses his own code to escape into the past. He returns to the year 1999, just after he was frozen, and Binder is sent back in time as well, making a clone of himself to keep watch while he pees from drinking the cheap beer and one of these clones sets out to kill an escaping Fry clone while the other attempts to self-destruct as per the paradox-correcting ways of the time travel portals. It takes Bender 12 years to finally track down Fry on his way back from the North Pole, blowing up Panucci's pizza and then waiting out his time back to the future. But when Fry reappears at his own future funeral, he reveals that only one of the clones was destroyed, as the other froze himself alongside himself in order to keep some continuity. Meanwhile, another Fry lives out his life unbeknownst to Bender. Fry went back in time an additional time to get some warm pizza from his failed delivery 1,007 years ago, and that Fry went on to live the past Fry's full life. Back in the future, Leela and Lars's wedding is cancelled when Lars backs out after discovering that time travel clones, like Hermes' stolen backwards body, are doomed. 
After the failed wedding, Earth is scammed out of the last of its land and water, forcing the remaining humans to Neptune, where a dejected Santa fails to wipe them out without his naughty list. So they mount a defense of the planet, with Hermes' detached head being used to coordinate Leela's fleet, and they're able to defeat most of the scammer aliens using a doomsday device the Professor had taken and then reverse stolen by Bender, praised for saving the Earth. But one last alien holds out, threatening a now tattoo-free fry for his time travel code, only for Lars to step forward and reveal that he's the one with the tattoo, having spent the years living Fry's old life falling in love with a mutated narwhal named Lilu, before realizing she's happier outside of captivity when he sees that she's fallen in love with another narwhal at the North Pole. This is the Fry that Bender believes himself to have killed, when in reality he merely damaged Fry's hair and voice box, creating the Lars that Leela fell in love with when he froze himself to go to the future using his narwhal training experience to work in the head museum. Lars ends up sacrificing himself by unthawing the failed self-destructing Bender, blowing up himself and the last of the aliens, before Bender reveals that he intends to keep the stolen past treasures held by the Benders who were waiting beneath Planet Express. Only for this many time paradoxes to create a rift in space as the credits roll. Futurama's return is heralded by an attack on the executives who cancelled the show, who are ground up into a fine powder and used in various humiliating ways throughout the movie, such as powdering Farnsworth's crotch and feeding the heads at the museum. In addition to this continuous callback, the movie also makes several leaps back to various major events throughout the show's run, from Seymour's fate to Fry's nephew living life in his shadow. These callbacks show a commitment by the new network to keeping the show's continuity intact, that they remember all the things that people loved about the show and are able to make reference to them. Except for the moments where the impact of several of these moments is taken away, if not outright contradicted. As it turns out, Yancey did not name his son after his missing brother, but rather his brother who simply moved out of his parents' house to live above a pizza restaurant. Seymour didn't actually wait several years for Fry to return from being frozen, but got to meet Fry every day as before being flash-frozen with his last memories of Fry's return just before Lars is, quote, born. And both of these are given the same amount of weight as Bender, causing the 2000 US election results. So these more heartfelt moments are undone, but this is in part due to the new network the writers are working alongside. Fox may not have approved of the more overtly left-wing messaging this movie references, nor would they have allowed some of the gorier and edgier aspects without some censorship being applied for general audiences. A nude beach planet or Hermes' bloody demises would not have aired on the old network, so this movie boldly declares that there are new standards and practices to fit into instead of the old guard's old ways. Overall, this is Comedy Central's foray into the Futurama universe, a means of showing that the writing staff hasn't lost their edge over the intervening years by making homage to old Futurama in various ways, while flexing their sci-fi muscles to prove that they can. An extremely convoluted time travel plot is introduced, involving a code to hack the universe that owes its existence to a stable time loop, a character who's revealed to be a copy of another character's whose existence is foreshadowed since before their first appearance, and an evacuation plot involving cameo appearances by practically every minor character who has thus far appeared in the show. This is weaved around multiple musical numbers, a remixed version of the main theme, and a plot that gives most of the main cast some role to play in a Save the Earth plot, fighting back against money-hungry scammers, who in some small way must have been a form of catharsis for the writers who were booted out of a job of passion due to their ratings being good but not great. Thus, a return to form that gives a single unifying message. Futurama is now being written by fans of Futurama, a statement which has been true since its very incarnation at the beginning, but which now starts to show a commitment to retreading old ground instead of risking offense by trying to reinvent canon that accidentally does the latter in its attempts to self-reference. The Beast with a Billion Backs Following the last movie, the universe has been torn asunder, though people are starting to grow bored of being panicked all the time and are beginning to resume their normal lives. This includes Fry's relationship with Colleen, a woman he met while ogling the rift, who offers to let him move in with her much to Bender's annoyance, and Fry's shock when he learns that Colleen has five boyfriends who also live with her, which turns out to be too much and Fry breaks up. Meanwhile, Farnsworth and Warrenstrom have temporarily put aside their differences to launch a probe into the anomaly. But when they deduce that robots cannot enter it, the government takes over and prepares to launch a missile at it. 
This missile backfires and smushes the newly Fon Fon Rubacht Kiff, leaving Amy as a widow. And the heartbroken Fry who stowed away on the ship uses the opportunity to enter the anomaly. Back on Earth, Bender is recovering from his injuries obtained from mooning the anomaly, proving that non-organic lifeforms can't cross over, and decides to start to stalk Calculon after the latter visits him in the hospital. While stalking him, he manages to let slip that he believes in a secret League of Robots that he gets the chance to join, warming up to the other bots by rigorously enforcing the rules on human killing. Once Fry makes contact with the entity on the other side of the rift, the entity wakes up and a swarm of tentacles rushes out to start attacking people. The efforts to defend the planet result in Wernstrom and Farnsworth getting under each other's skin again, while also being useless to prevent the invasion, and soon, most of the side cast is grabbed by the tentacle beast, and they announce that they actually enjoy being part of the hive mind. They enjoy it so much that a new tentacult is formed, with Fry as the pope of this new religion, spreading the word to the world, and even making his peace with Colleen in the process. Leela, Amy, and Zap Brannigan are the last non-tentacled people in the world, with Zap convincing Amy to sleep with him in their shared grief over losing Kiff. Afterwards, Leela infiltrates the church to take it down from the inside, eventually managing to force the tentacle monster to reveal Sklur's self as Yivo, who has been watching the universe since the Big Bang and was waiting for a chance to meet up. After feeling guilt about smushing Kiff and then bringing him back from the dead, Yivo decides to woo the entire population of the universe the proper way, eventually asking everybody at once to marry Shklim when they started to show doubts about Schnler commitment. So the whole universe is taken across the rift in golden escalators to live with Yivo, whose surface inspired the Earth vision of heaven. Bender gets into an argument with Calculon over his hatred of humans, and they have a duel, resulting in Calculon being maimed and quitting the League of Robots, putting Bender in charge. Bender uses his charge to declare war on humanity, planning on raising an army from robot hell to take over the planet. But when he finds out that the Earth is abandoned, total domination doesn't feel so great. After Fry writes him a letter about how happy he is living on Yivo, Bender decides to invade the Universal Rift to get his friend back, and a jealous Yevo kicks everybody, except Colleen, off of Sklur's surface after finding out that Fry has been seeing other universes. In the end, Bender declares that love isn't supposed to be perfect, but that the petty, jealous arguments that define their relationships are what love is supposed to be about. None of the relationships in this episode slash movie are perfect, especially not the perfect ones. Fry and Colleen start out by bonding over their mutual fear of the anomaly, and have a few days of peace until he moves in with her, realizing that she's a polygamist, and eventually realizing that this lifestyle is not for him. And yet, when Yivo starts to invade the universe, Fry starts to change his mind about the idea of sharing a partner, that so long as you really love the other person, it's fine to put up with a little bit of abnormality in the relationship, and his problem was more about the fact that Colleen never let him know about what he was getting into. Kiff and Amy also have a perfect relationship, with the two families meeting up over the Fon Fon Rue ceremony. Shortly after Kiff dies, Amy ends up sleeping with Zap after Zap reveals that he, too, had some feelings for the guy. Whether this was just a ploy to manipulate her, or a genuine showing of affection for his former assistant, is ambiguous, as both are in character for Zap. But the fact of the matter is that they both moved on far too quickly for a happy relationship to be mourned properly. And when Kiff returns and refuses to associate with Amy for the betrayal, it's Bender who plays this off as part of a normal relationship. The Professor even has a short-lived relationship with Wernstrom, not so much a romantic one as a rivalry that pushes both of them to try to innovate in their hardness, for the Earth Barrier, I mean. And it's them working together that results in the bit of stagnation that lets the military take over what they would have before made into private enterprise. So when Yivo comes into the universe and starts trying to woo all sentient life there, this is presented as a perfect relationship. Everybody who gets tentacled is happy, with all of their problems being eliminated as a result of their union with the entity that used to terrify them. And yet, even this was not a completely clean relationship. Yivo reveals Shkli's been stalking the universe for eons and worse, latches the non consentacles onto people's necks without telling them their reproductive organs, building quadrillions of relationships on a lack of communication and withholding information. Shkli even victim blames the universe before the population starts their first argument together. It's ultimately the relationship between Bender and Fry that ends up undoing every development and bringing the universe back to a Yivo-free existence. 
Fry may be happy with Yevo, but he was still willing to keep in touch with Bender, in spite of Yevo's controlling tendencies of refusing to allow Schler new bows to contact the robots at all. Bender may not have realized it, but he still valued Fry's companionship enough that even conquering the known universe doesn't feel fulfilling without him. And Fry trying to maintain a relationship that's non-controlling, or at least as controlling, conquering the known universe isn't exactly hands-off, is ultimately what makes people go back to their messy relationships, but with an idea of the fact that all relationships are messy, even the perfect ones. Bender's Game The kids are playing Dungeons and Dragons, taunting Bender for his lack of an imagination before ultimately convincing him to join them until he's able to flex his way into divulging into his inner fantasy world. Meanwhile, the Planet Express crew enters their ship into a demolition derby in spite of the professor's warnings not to waste fuel. And for taking the ship out in this reckless way, Leela is punished with a collar that shocks her anytime she's angry. Eventually, Bender gets so obsessed with his new D&D obsession that he stops separating fantasy and reality, going out to attack and steal from people while believing he's Titanius Anglesmith of Cornwood, and being committed to an asylum for these delusions. Back at Planet Express, the professor comes up with the scheme to overthrow Mom's monopoly on all dark matter mining, explaining that when he first charged the universe's dark matter, he created two dodecahedrons, one kept by Mom, and another that he misplaced, though this misplaced D12 is eventually tracked down as one of the die being used by the kids in their D&D game. Mom's attempts at stealing it back for safekeeping are bungled by her three stooges, or three children, and the professor obtains the piece needed to decharge all the dark matter, the effect being reversed if they come within six inches of one another. Fry, Leela, and the professor sneak into her mining facility in order to sabotage her production, discovering that it's not actually a mine, but a fecal matter harvesting facility where the Nibblonians are kept in crates and force-fed. Mom's harvesting of the dark matter on Nibbler's old planet was the thing that caused it to collapse in the first place. Igner, Mom's youngest and dumbest child, catches them, but assists in the escape where they're caught once more just before managing to put the dodecahedrons together. And as they fall, a portal opens up due to the flickering power of the dark matter that combined with Bender's stolen cache of fuel, and he vanishes from reality during a botched robotomy at the asylum that failed to cure him. The Planet Express crew wakes up in a fantasy universe with the dodecahedron serving as the die of power, with unpredictable effects while Mom's friendly robot company becomes the demon Momon and her minions. They set out on a journey to destroy the die of power by tossing it into the plastic mold it was forged in, a recreation of the plot of Lord of the Rings, which each character serving as some parallel to a member of the Fellowship. They meet Hermaphrodites of the Centaurs, a pacifist community that rejects Legola for her violent ways, and they travel through the Cave of Hopelessness, where Legola's slaying, well, maiming, of Zoidberg causes her to renounce violence as well. Fry starts to feel seduced by the power of the One Ring, or the Dice of Power, and leaves the party after a failed assassination attempt. After failing to recruit more allies at White Castle due to Roberto's insanity, the remaining party is attacked by Mamon's forces, ultimately being saved when Legola returns with the rest of the Centaurs, having debated Hermaphrodites into assisting, and they meet up with Fry in Mamon's lair to fight over the die. Mom wins the fight despite Igner revealing that he's Farnsworth's son and trying to help them, and the whole group returns to the real world where Mom plans on injecting Farnsworth with prunes to force him to evacuate the dodecahedron from his vowels. But he pleads with her to hug his long-lost son one time, and it's revealed that Igner ate the other die, with their hug decharging the dark matter and destroying Mom's monopoly. With the fuel source gone, the Earth's scientific minds are spurred into coming up with a more sustainable form of energy, with Farnsworth proposing Niblonian slave labor. At the start of my first Futurama retrospective, I mentioned that science fiction is a genre about the present, that it uses analogy to make points about our current world and its events, so that we can draw conclusions on what the author believes about trends in society. Similarly, fantasy is also a genre defined by its relationship to the real world, combining the escapism of fantasy to offer visions of the world that can simultaneously explain what about it needs to be removed to make our problems disappear, while also offering us characters whose worldviews differ from our own to offer a lens through which we can explore why others might have even considered these problems in the first place. 
And here, both genres are combined in such a way that simile becomes a simile for simile, and the conventions of each parody are combined in such a way that references in one are used to provide context for the references in another. This makes little sense when I say it without an example, so I'll provide a few now. Mom has a monopoly on fuel in-universe, using this monopoly as a means of controlling just about anything that uses transportation in any part of its logistics chain. The professor mentions how scientists like himself are not addressing the problem, as it's not pressing enough to do so. That the increase in pricing happened so steadily that people got used to it, like frogs in a slowly heating pot. It's not until the dodecahedrons are nearing destruction that Mom sets out to violently defend her grasp on society, the demonic forces within Cornwood declaring war against the Fellowship in the interest of maintaining the status quo, though this is a status quo of continuous corporate expansion as Mom's company tries to vertically integrate more and more under their umbrella, squeezing out as much value from people as possible in a subjugation that resembles Sauron's forces more than a corporate enterprise. It's not a big secret that Futurama is written by a bunch of Star Trek nerds. In fact, if I made a point of mentioning every single reference to that franchise within this one, I'd have to double the length of these videos, and then I couldn't use the word brief in the title. As with most fantasies, be they future or past, when you exclude a similarity to current or historical cultures, you're doing so in a way that often highlights the gap where they used to be. Either your world-building borrows from modern society, and thus comments on it, or your world-building deviates from society, and thus comments on it. It's like how Star Trek presents a utopian version of the future with no money and no race, or how Lord of the Rings explains its antagonist in the context of an industrializing war machine. So Tolkien writes a trilogy about the constant fight up between good and evil, that good must be constantly reaffirmed to prevent the spread of despair, and this despair is played by a character who serves in Futurama as an analogy to the ever-growing power of an oligarchic corporate class in a present society. And this, in the end, is the writer's way of pointing out how greed is a darkness that can only be fought by not giving in to helplessness, like assuming there's nothing you can do. Into the Wild Green Yonder Amy's father, Leo Wong, bulldozes the old Mars Vegas and builds a new Mars Vegas. But when a group of feminist environmentalists protests his destruction of the environment, Leela gets involved to the movement after saving a muck leech, and Fry is injured by one of the feminists falling on top of him, with her pendant getting stuck in his forehead. Leo Wong gives him free admittance to a poker tournament in exchange for not suing, as well as giving the rest of Planet Express free rooms. While attending a show, Bender falls for a dancer named Fanny, who turns out to be the Dawnbot's wife, and their affair starts to rouse his suspicions. Meanwhile, Fry is pulled aside by a mad homeless man who identifies him as a fellow mind reader. Now knowing about his powers, Fry enters the poker tournament, opposite of Bender, who is using a series of lucky charms, including one stolen from the Donbot, to win the tournament. Bender's luck ends up beating Fry's mind reading, and he wins the money, getting pulled aside by the Donbot and buried in the desert as a warning. Taking this warning to heart, Bender breaks things off with Fanny, and the crew goes to Leo Wong's resort, where he announces his plans to create the universe's largest mini-golf course the final hole being constructed on top of a purple dwarf star. The professor is bribed into signing off on an environmental survey, which serves as the last straw for Leela, who joins the environmentalists from before. Fry is kidnapped by the League of Mad Fellows, a group of tinfoil hat-wearing mind readers, and they explain that they have to keep their mind reading powers a secret to avoid being detected by a group of beings they call the Dark Ones, a species set on wiping out as many species as possible. They reveal that they serve the Encyclopods, who preserve the DNA of endangered species before being wiped out, but not before leaving a single egg that is set to hatch when a pulsar starts back up. And all of this is centered on the purple dwarf star set to be destroyed for the mini golf course. As the Dark Ones can read minds, Fry cannot tell anybody that he's investigating the destruction, as the plan will be foiled if it's known about. So he signs up to be a security guard at Wong's resort to get closer to the plan, so that he might sabotage it. But Leela views this as Fry being a traitor to her cause, and they begin to drift apart. After more and more women join the protest, Binder is hired by the government to place a wiretap on Fry's phone to track down Leela's location. This location is revealed to be not far from the League of Mad Fellows' headquarters, and the whole cast is brought together when the feminists kidnap Planet Express. In spite of Amy's mini golf skills, they're still captured by Zap Brannigan and taken to the Supreme Court, sent to jail, where Leela attempts to have the muck leech de rescued before tunnel them out. 
but instead of the muck leech, it's Bender who breaks them out of jail as he was becoming jealous of Leela's rap sheet. They rush to the demolition of the Dwarf Star, where Fry is planning on detecting whose mind he can't read to find out who the Dark One is. Leela steals the detonator, but Fry asks her to trust him with it, despite not being able to tell her or anyone else his plan. She hands it over to him, and Fry concludes that he can't read his own mind, so he plans on using an Omega device to destroy himself. But the Muck Leech from before is the one killed by it, revealing himself as the true form of the Dark One. In the end, the Encyclopod Egg hatches, and the creature retains the DNA of the endangered human species before flying off. Zap Brannigan is still under orders to arrest them for sabotaging the destruction of the Dwarf Star, and chases them back into space, where they fly into a wormhole to escape, leaving the future of the series ambiguous. We're introduced here to two races that have evolved in an arms race since the beginning of time. One that represents an inherent evil in the universe, and the other that reflects an inherent goodness. And the means through which these two are explained also shows what the showrunners view as the most important aspects of humanity and life, knowledge. The Dark Ones are bad, and the reason for being bad is due to the fact that they represent entropy, destroying things for the sake of destruction, or because it's the natural order for one force to overwhelm the other. This sort of social Darwinism is often used as a justification for growth for the sake of growth expansion outward, eschewing laws about environmental protections because if evolution wanted this species to live, they would be better at defending themselves. In the same way, if one person was more worthy of controlling the world than another, it's because their line is stronger and thus more worthy of having the position to destroy others. And the opposite of this self-righteous destruction of the universe is the preservation of knowledge, mirrored in a desire to preserve life in the universe, even if it is a scum-sucking muck leech. The feminists are consistently portrayed as annoying, but putting up with that is a small price to pay when a fundamental destruction of a force preventing entropy is at risk. People often like to choose sides in an argument based off which personality is more personable or charismatic, rather than looking at the actual results of each ideology. The people trying to destroy the planet are offering me no benefit, and even putting my own life indirectly at risk, but the people trying to prevent this destruction were annoying, so I'm siding with the corporation. It's always been the method of the writers to present two sides of an argument and then to crack jokes wherever they can find humor, but at a point, it's important to realize that some people are going to start basing their belief system around whatever they find funny on TV. So the sappy and sentimental needs to win out in the end just often enough that people aren't agreeing with a comedic sociopath, be them a harmless stereotype like Bender, or a more realistic villain like Leo Wong. And so what better way to send off the series than by leaving their futures less than certain? On one hand, the romantic relationship between Fry and Leela is given closure, something alluded to the last time the series was dropped, but confirmed here, just as they fly into a wormhole that will kill them all if the series isn't reborn, but simply transports them somewhere else if it is, Futurama never had the luxury of knowing for sure what's in store for the future, in spite of the irony in the fact that it ostensibly is a show about just that. But the showrunners at least accept to hedge their scripts in such a way that they can at the very least be satisfied with whatever note they end on. Season 6 After the movies were written, but before they were produced, Comedy Central was able to get the rights to produce 26 more episodes, which would be split into 13 episode cores, with a few months of break between them. This gives season 6 and 7 the distinction of being split into season 6A and 6B, though for the purpose of this video, I will not be making this distinction and will treat each full season as a single entity. There was some confusion before the seasons were produced as to payment, resulting in a few of the writers for the earlier seasons not being retained for the revival. This also resulted in an alleged pay dispute among the cast, as Fox refused to meet the per-episode demands. But this is something that the voice cast never explicitly confirmed, and may have simply been an extrapolation of a similar dispute occurring with the cast of The Simpsons, including Fox announcing auditions to replace many of the roles, auditions that never actually happened and were likely a bluff. Given the length between seasons, Matt Groening had mentioned a desire to reboot the franchise during the revival, something that partially was inspired by the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies released around the same time. This was ultimately dropped in favor of a rebirth of the series, giving the first episode its name. Rebirth Fry approaches the professor, inquiring about his frizzy hair and burn scars. Farnsworth silences him, as he's busy preparing the bodies of the Planet Express crew to be reborn from a vat of stem cells. 
Bender and Leela don't come back properly, with Bender requiring a doomsday device to be implanted in his chest cavity that overloads, forcing him to party hard to burn off the extra energy so he doesn't explode. And Leela returns in a deep coma, with no way to wake her up. So a distraught Fry takes her memories from the Planet Express surveillance tapes and uploads them into a robotic body so he can continue to spend time with his new girlfriend. Leela doesn't take this especially well, and before she can adapt to the fact that she's a robotic replica, they attend the funeral for the comatose Leela, who, as per her donor card, is to be fed to a beast that only eats cyclopses. But when Bender's partying gets too hard, the comatose Leela wakes up and is shocked at the fact that there are two of her. Fry confesses that he loves both Leelas, which makes the human Leela jealous of the robot and the two fight, urging Fry to choose between them. Fry refuses to choose and accidentally shoots himself, revealing that he, too, is a robot. The professor then reveals what really happened. Fry shielded Leela from the destruction of the Planet Express ship at the end of last season with his own body, and there was too little of him left to make a clone. So Leela was the one to make a robotic Fry, only for the robot to explode, killing them both and explaining the burn scars on Fry at the start of the episode. In the end, the robot Fry and Leela strip off their human skin and leave to be together, while the partied out Bender ends up destroying the Cyclops beast with just enough output to bring his energy levels down to normal. Futurama, and Planet Express, returns from its ambiguous ending to the surprise of no one who saw how much time was left in this video. And this episode shows the extent to which some aspects will be carried over and how some will not be, as well as serving as an entry point for anybody adjusting after the new channel hosting the show. The characters are brought back to life one by one, with Fry saying their names aloud to reintroduce them. But to show what's changed, the showrunners have also taken steps to show what is now canon. Specifically, Fry's ambiguous relationship with Leela is no longer ambiguous. The kiss of the finale of the previous movie is confirmed to be indicative of a long-term relationship. And far from this relationship being the sort of one-way prize many contemporary shows may have included, that is to say, the woman has a limited personality and exists to be won by a certain amount of persistence, Futurama makes an attempt to show that this is a totally reciprocated affair. Fry is so distraught at the loss of Leela that he attempts to create a replacement for her, and his actions make up the bulk of the episode. But at the end, we learn that Leela has done the exact same thing before the start of the plot, subverting not only the main narrative, but the audience's expectations of conventional storytelling. In Agata de Leela A Death Star-like entity is traveling the galaxy, blacking planets out of existence one by one, and it's headed for Earth next. Nixon orders a top-secret mission to destroy it from the inside with the stealth craft the Professor designed. Leela volunteers to fly the ship, and Brannigan volunteers to go along with her, but their attempt is unsuccessful when the v Giny star notices them, and their ship is damaged on the way out. Leela wakes up trapped beneath the fallen tree, and Zap Brannigan searches around for food and water in a crude recreation of the story of Adam and Eve. But after eating a bit of apple, Leela starts to rehydrate and, no longer delirious, begins to piece together suspicious parts of Brannigan's story. That the nuts he's been finding were just the trail mix from the trip, and that they're not even marooned on a distant planet, but have been on Earth all along. Meanwhile, the professor figures out the source of the v Giny satellite. It's two Earth satellites that combine together, with the new purpose of censoring parts of the universe it deems perverse. After failing to convince the people of Earth to clean up their act, the Planet Express crew heads to a remote island to try to prove that Earth is unspoiled, stumbling upon Leela and Zap in the wilderness. The v Giny satellite finds the group and demands that Zap and Leela consummate their Christian marriage, with Leela begrudgingly going along with it to get home, while Zap pretends that it was part of his plan all along. It should hopefully go without saying, but Zap Brannigan's actions in this episode are tantamount to one of those things I can't say on YouTube, but hopefully is clear enough that I don't need to. Throughout the entire episode, he comes up with a series of contrivances in order to trick Leela into believing that the two have to sleep together, mimicking a Bible story in order to do the deed. The primary way in which he's able to manipulate Leela is by trapping her in one place, obscuring the rubble of the ship, and keeping her delirious from dehydration. In other words, he prevents her from ever discovering the truth for herself. Manipulation of a person's feelings is most easily done by stifling the flow of knowledge or potential flow of knowledge. And so this ties into the other plot of the episode. v Giny's primary purpose is to censor things that it views as offensive or improper. Despite this directive, the satellite still opts not to only permit, but force Zap and Leela to consummate their union at the end of the episode to keep the Earth intact. An act hardly different from what Zap was attempting to do, but relabeled under the lens of being correct, 
as it's a Bible reference. So when absolute power is placed into the hands of an entity whose purpose is to block information deemed offensive, then that entity will quickly start to deem any information that conflicts with its worldview as offensive, all the while portraying its actions as being for the mutual good of society. Attack of the Killer App After an e-waste recycling day that ends with the Planet Express crew visiting the planet where their electronics are melted down, Leela decides to start preserving electronic devices more frequently by buying less, until they see an ad for the new iPhone, and head out to purchase them. After a long wait, the phones are installed and quickly take over the lives of most people on Earth as they constantly share the things that they're perpetually recording. All the while, Mom is collecting their data, with the intention of releasing a twit worm that will turn the followers of the first account to reach 1 million followers into mindless consumerist zombies. Meanwhile, Fry and Bender hold a competition to see who will get to that number first, with Bender taking the lead due to his ability to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Fry, realizing he might have to bathe in a pool of goat excrement, ends up discovering that Leela has a singing boil on her butt named Susan, and when he records it, the video becomes popular enough that the bet ends in a draw. But Fry feels bad about embarrassing Leela in this way, and he tries to apologize by diving into the goat pool himself, only for Leela to say that he didn't need to do any of that after she realizes that internet fame is too fleeting for the video to have any long-term effects. In the end, Mom unleashes her virus, and a crowd of people line up to buy the iPhone 2. This episode begins and ends in a similar vein, by satirizing the mindless way in which large groups of people can demand a certain product because of demand for the product. At first, people are all throwing away old electronics while ignoring the clear signs that their recycling drive is really just an excuse to push the dirty work out of sight and out of mind. And in spite of Leela hoping to do something about that, once she gets caught up in the fervor of the new iPhone, she too decides that it's best to go along with the crowd to get the new shiny thing. This effect stays throughout the episode, with Mom ultimately turning people into an army of mindless zombies, only to order them to buy the new phone that they likely would have bought anyway. The fact that Mom is attempting to make an army of mindless zombies is a background event. The bigger concern to the characters and audience alike comes from the mundanity of two people competing to make a more popular social media account at the expense of themselves and those around them. While the idea of an unscrupulous internet influencer is much more common to us today, back when this episode aired the internet was still in a less monetized era, meaning that people like Fry weren't even selling out their friends for money, merely paving the way for those who later would. Proposition Infinity Bender is arrested for vandalizing multiple surfaces around New New York, and he calls Amy to bail him out as she's rich enough to do so, right after she and Kiff have an argument over his lack of a spine, metaphorically. While at the prison, Amy keeps flirting with every bad boy she sees and Kiff gets mad enough to walk out on her. While celebrating being single again, Bender proceeds to make fun of her enough that she starts to view him as a bad boy, and the two sleep together. The next day, they try to hide the affair, as robosexual relationships are taboo, but eventually it's discovered during a tornado farming incident. Amy is taken to her parents' ranch while Bender is sent to a church retreat, and the two are straightened out, though Fry breaks Amy out of her parents', while the rest of the crew then infiltrates the retreat to get Bender away. After this, they vow to get robosexual relationships legalized and begin a protest movement that culminates in a debate between Bender and the professor. During this meeting, Farnsworth regales the tale of an old love of his that he lost to robosexuality, only to remember that she herself was a robot. In the end, Bender and Amy are able to get married only for Bender to take exception to the concept of monogamy, breaking things off with Amy, who then goes back to Kiff. Another consecutive episode that very explicitly covers an ongoing recent event, this one too having the unfortunate position of aging poorly due to changing ideas of the topic at hand. While the idea of smartphones invading every aspect of our social lives was new at the time, now the episode reads like an old man yelling at kids these days, the episode becoming more and more out of touch, purely out of a sense that it's retreading things that have been said far too often. This episode too has wound up aging poorly, in part because people are much more cognizant of issues like same-sex marriage by now. The professor is portrayed as an out-of-touch old man with deeply personal reasons for opposing robosexuality, giving the impression that most who try to support this sort of thinking are also just repressed individuals, rather than the truth, 
government entities trying to scaremonger people into believing in threats that aren't there by targeting a minority group like this so they can normalize surveillance and regulation. Convince enough people that the gay agenda is a real boogeyman and that children are in danger and they'll eagerly accept the government getting involved in people's personal lives, regulating what can and cannot happen in the privacy of your own home while believing that any person who believes in their right to privacy must be a predator of sorts. Stories like this have a tendency to push the blame of bigotry onto the ignorant rather than the people taking advantage of that ignorance, and they often wind up alienating people from the truth in doing so. The Da Vinci Code Fry is tired of everybody making fun of him for his stupidity all the time, so the professor takes some pity on him to explain what a real genius is and introduces him to the historical figure of Leonardo da Vinci. When Fry destroys da Vinci's beard, the two discover the plans to an unknown device inside, and the professor tries to decipher the schematics, eventually searching for clues inside the Last Supper, and heading to Rome to see if there are any more clues in the man's works. This leads them to find Animatronio, a robot made by da Vinci to guard his secrets, though not very well because he continuously reveals more and more of them. They are ultimately led to the Pantheon, where they discover a cache of old inventions that all work together to make a spacecraft that launches Fry and Farnsworth to another planet, da Vinci's homeworld, Vinci. They tour this planet for a while, learning about its population of geniuses as the professor is continuously humbled by the advanced mathematics courses there. Eventually, Leonardo da Vinci confesses to Fry that among the population of his home planet, he's actually the stupid Venetian alive, and he asks for help with assembling his lost machine. Once it's done, he has a grand unveiling where he reveals that the machine is a doomsday device meant to get revenge on those who made fun of him, and the professor joins in on the destruction. But Fry, appalled at what he helped to build, sabotages the machine after talking down the others for trying to seek revenge for their own faults. If you're the smartest person in a room, then it's usually time to find a smarter room. There's nothing that you can learn from hanging around there and nowhere to go but down as you start to blend in more and more with the company you keep. This isn't just for intelligence either, it can apply to anything one's able to work towards, like playing a sport against local amateurs and refusing to go to the big leagues due to a fear of losing once again because you have to play people at your own skill level. Refusing to hang around people smarter than you will only ensure that you're never challenged, and challenge is what forces people to get better. Leonardo da Vinci is portrayed as the type of person who, when challenged, starts to resent the people who are asking more of him, even if they do so in a rude way, and tries to plot a means of tearing them down instead of elevating himself. Likewise, he spent so many years on Earth so he could pretend he was better than he was, knowing full well he was merely taking shelter in a less challenging environment to protect his own ego. And Farnsworth proves himself no better, bragging about his intellect right up until the point where he no longer has that as a distinction. And instead of being improvement-minded and using the opportunity to grow, he too joins in on the self-destructive method of thinking or bringing down others instead of bringing himself up. Lethal Inspection Bender is making fun of the humans' fear of death during a war reenactment as he's effectively immortal due to the fact that his memories can be backed up into a new body if he gets destroyed. But while bragging, he springs an oil leak and discovers that he has no backup unit, meaning he can die like everyone else. So he sets out to learn the identity of a mysterious Inspector 5 who signed off on his flawlessness so he can beat up the guy for revenge. He takes Hermes along with him to navigate the bureaucracy. But their search through the central bureaucracy comes up with nothing except a series of dead ends, so Bender calls Mom's friendly robot company to lodge a complaint about his defective nature, only for Mom to try to destroy the evidence of a broken unit. Bender and Hermes flee the hit squad and wind up at the US-Mexican border, near the factory where Bender was constructed. They enter the factory and look around, finding a phone book with the address of the inspector in question, only for that to be abandoned as well. The hit squad follows them there and opens fire, with Hermes quickly trying to hack into the terminal to list the robot as terminated so the robots will stop shooting. After the house is destroyed, Hermes limbos out of the wreckage, and they return home with Bender having a new appreciation of life. But after he leaves, Hermes attempts to destroy the evidence he's been picking up along the trip that he himself was Inspector 5, having allowed Bender to live in the first place as he didn't have the heart to incinerate the defective bot. 
Binder learns that without death, life has less value. This is actually just a basic economic principle. When life is in high supply, the price goes down. When it's in short supply, it's more valuable. So a limited lifespan comes with an increased desire to make something out of that lifespan. And this, in part, explains Binder's casual attitude towards life. The reason he's so nihilistic, is believing that nothing matters, is because he has plenty of time to leave his mark on the world if he chooses to do so. But when he learns that his time is potentially limited, he rushes out, not to make something of himself, but to get revenge on the person who doomed him to being mortal. Dooming someone to mortality is just a fancy way of saying giving somebody a life. That the person who gave you the opportunity to exist is the one who put a time limit on that existence. A person who cannot die, who views their time left as unlimited, will never consciously amount to anything out of a lack of a desire to do so. This isn't just limited to immortals. Plenty of regular, killable people have a tendency to put things off until later, only to have a midlife crisis around the time they realize that they one day might pass away that they ought to do something with their lives while they're still able to do so. The Late Philip J. Fry Fry gets berated by Leela for showing up late to everything, including a planned dinner between them. He tries to improve his punctuality during her birthday celebration in a cavern restaurant that night, but as he showed up late for work that morning, he has to stay late to help the professor test his new invention, a time machine that only goes forward. But despite insisting that they were only going to go a minute forward, the professor slips and they travel into the year 10,000 instead. Fry laments that he's missed his date with Leela, but the professor insists that they try to keep going forward, hoping they can find a future year where a backwards time machine is invented. But Fry, Bender, and the Professor keep bickering among themselves, and eventually wind up at the end of time. Fry wanders away and finds the cavern where he was supposed to have dined with Leela, noticing a note she left in the condensation. As it turns out, Fry's birthday card for Leela explained his absence in the intervening years where she and Hermes ran Planet Express to a successful future. He returns to the time machine, and the men prepare to observe the end of the universe, only to discover that time is cyclical. After a few trips around, they land back in the year 3010, crushing themselves to prevent a time paradox, and Fry is able to make his date with Leela after all. Fry and Leela's relationship was always a small part of the original run of Futurama, but as of the start of this season, their standing is now on much more confirmed footing. But confirmed does not necessarily mean solid, and they have their share of troubles with one another's personalities. The end result is that Fry and Leela still get to have just as many fights and arguments with one another, but the difference here is that the end result of each episode has them getting back together instead of breaking up. It gives a more reasonable ending to the episodes, as the writers can only tease a ship like that for so often before it starts to become unrealistic they'd even interact one way or another. And this long overdue development is able to be flexed here, as Fry gets the opportunity to watch the universe end shortly after he believes he's lost his last chance with Leela. Throughout the future, he wants nothing more than to go back to spend time with her, making his travels metaphorical as much as physical. Without Leela, Fry cannot fathom an eternity passing with anything worthwhile going on. Leela too is shown to have undergone a similar character journey here, trying and failing to replace Fry as she realizes that her anger at him for skipping out on their dates is an anger born out of love. The worst thing Fry can do to Leela is to deny himself to her for one reason or another. That darn cats. Nibbler starts to demand that Leela takes him more seriously, to stop treating him like a pet, and to elevate him to an equal among Planet Express. Amy stays out too late celebrating the night before she presents her thesis, and winds up making a poor presentation about an engine powered by the Earth's rotational momentum. Her doctorate is denied by a team of scientists, including a Dr. Katz, whose pet cat infiltrates Planet Express and takes the place of Nibbler on Leela's lap. Amy, who is allergic to cats, teams up with Nibbler, who resents losing his own position, to figure out what that cat is up to, and they discover the whole crew has become obsessed with the animals. Worse, they constructed the device from Amy's thesis and are currently about to tap into the Earth's core. Professor Katz is revealed to be a puppet controlled by the cat, who himself is an alien from the planet Thubian 9, a planet that has become tidally locked, whose inhabitants settled on Earth with the intention of stealing the planet's time. 
They grew fat and lazy when the ancient Egyptians spoiled them, but when Professor Katz saw Amy's device, he stole the plans and brainwashed the population to build it. Once Earth's rotation is stolen, the cats return to their home world, leaving Earth to cook and freeze. But Amy gets the idea to simply start up the machine once again, causing the Earth to continue spinning, just in the wrong direction. For her idea, she's rewarded with the PhD she failed to get at the start of the episode. Considering how little professoring the professor does and how little studying Amy does, it's easy to forget that they're a professor and student. And considering we've had a few episodes since Nibbler learned that the crew all knows about his backstory, it's an eventuality that this plot would likewise be answered. So the unlikely pairing of Amy and Nibbler gets explored here. Two characters who often serve as background gags or the occasional comic relief now become the center of attention in an episode where everyone else's personality is erased to be a cat fanatic. This episode also creates a situation where the two characters get to have their past actions compared. Amy is actually a competent engineering student, a fact of her personality that's often overlooked for her party girl personality. The latter personality is a type of character that fits in with the rest of Futurama's cast. Everyone is silly in some way and hard to take seriously. Even the professor's best inventions seem to be things built in spite of him instead of because of him. Nibbler also originally came to Earth with unknown intentions as part of a greater plan, similar to Dr. Katz. And Dr. Katz is merely trying to save his own home world, even though it is at the expense of another planet. A Clockwork Origin Farnsworth learns about a group of creationists blocking Hubert's school and sets out to argue with them in an attempt to disprove their theories. But the professor in charge of the protest, Dr. Banjo, refuses to listen to the proof and keeps asking for more and more of it, eventually resulting in Farnsworth getting mad enough to find proof of his proof of his proof of his... and so on. After finding this proof and presenting it as Homo Farnsworth, the creationists refuse to acknowledge it and the professor announces he doesn't want to live on the planet anymore. He settles on an uninhabited planet and releases nanobots into the water to clean it up. But these nanobots rapidly evolve into trilobites and begin attacking the Planet Express crew, who take shelter in a cave as their ship is destroyed. Over the next few days, the bots become dinosaurs before being destroyed by a solar flare with only a few underground mammal bots surviving. Soon, the crew is discovered by an anthropologist bot who takes them into a museum as the missing link between early and modern bot but Farnsworth is accused of being anti-science for claiming to have created them all. While awaiting a jury's deliberation for his insanity plea, the robots evolve into a higher life form and move beyond the squabble, letting the Planet Express crew return home, where Farnsworth finds a middle ground between evolution and intelligent design. The greatest mistake that Professor Farnsworth makes in this episode is the fact that he bothers to engage in bad faith discourse in the first place. Dr. Banjo argues for creationism, attempting to make himself into a scientific expert on the subject, despite the fact that he ignores many of the data points that would have convinced an actual scientist. When he's shown facts that contradict his beliefs, he doubles down on the beliefs and demands more. So it becomes clear that this is not an argument based on the truth or the search for the truth, but an argument based on the argument itself. It's a desire to split the world into the us party and the them party, and then to accuse the thems of being wrong no matter the context and the us's of being morally and factually correct, especially when they're not. If a person's belief system is a belief system not based on facts or logic, then it cannot be disproven by facts or logic, an especially frustrating debacle when one party claims to use facts and logic to develop their way of thinking. It would be easy to simply dismiss a bad faith actor and then to refuse to engage with them, as Farnsworth actually does, but there's still the nagging idea that, if left alone, misinformation has a tendency to spread. The best solution is to try and find a mind that hasn't already been made up, or at least to convince people to have an open mind even after they believe they know the truth. The worst thing one can do is to totally shut themselves off from any challenge to what they already think they know. The Prisoner of Benda Amy and the professor put the finishing touches on their mind-swapping machine, and while lamenting their diets, Amy tired of forcing herself not to eat, and the professor being far too skinny, they agree to swap bodies to live out their fantasies. After a bit of time passes, they agree to swap back, only to learn that the cerebral immune response prevents two bodies that have switched minds to switch back directly. But Bender, who's hoping to switch bodies with people for an elaborate scheme to steal a crown from an emperor, 
decides to switch bodies with Amy so that he can swim aboard the ship and seduce the guard, unknowingly actually switching with the professor instead. Amy, as the professor, swaps with Leela, which disgusts Fry, making Leela, in the professor's body, believe that he's only attracted to her physically. Hoping to catch Leela being a hypocrite, Fry swaps with Zoidberg in an attempt to challenge her beliefs. Amy, as Leela, has become fat from overeating and Hermes offers to swap with her as he's already ruined his own body. Amy, as Hermes, sees Fry and Leela, Zoidberg and the Professor, making out at Elzar's, as Elzar, and loses her appetite for good while the Professor, in Bender's body, starts doing irresponsible circus stunts before learning that Bender, now in the Emperor of Robo-Hungary's body, is being attacked by a traitor to his country. He asks Big Bertha, a cannon bot one shot away from death, to transport him over, stopping the assassination attempt with the help of the Rombo-Hungarian carnies. In the end, he asks the Harlem Globetrotters to come up with a mathematical proof that can get everyone back to their original bodies while working around the catch that they can't swap twice, and soon, everything is back to normal. To give this episode a more thematic conclusion, we only have to look at the words of Big Bertha, the near-death cannon bot. She refuses the professor's offer to switch with a younger body to continue with her life, stating that each crack on her chassis is merely the mark of a life well lived, and to throw away the signs of a good life is also to throw away parts of that good life as well. She convinces the professor to return to his old body and to wear his age with pride, not to be ashamed of having lived for so long, as it erases the gravity of his many accomplishments. I left out a few of the body swaps and subplots as this was an episode with very little of an overarching plot so no mention of how the Robo-Hungarian Emperor and Zoidberg blew up Fry's apartment, or how Scruffy made out with his mop bucket. The plot only really exists to give an excuse to put the characters in each other's bodies, and to allow some hilarity to ensue as we watch the characters act out of character, while also being in character at the same time. What's especially well done are the moments wherein we get to see the physical traits carry over, like the Professor walking with the same cantor of Leela, or Amy's body sitting the way Bender typically does. This episode is also a means of facilitating what has to be one of the most typical methods of expression for the Futurama writing team, that they were able to create a new mathematical proof to resolve the episode, one that's actually properly notated. The claim to fully understand how this proof actually works is beyond me as I failed math in high school, I failed English too, which is why I write for a living. Lur-reconcilable indifferences Ndund nags Lur about his lack of interest in conquering planets, chiding him for being too lazy to conquer anything. So he heads to Earth to invade, landing in a comic convention where people think he's just doing cosplay. Dismayed by the lack of response, he returns home, only for Ndund to kick him out of the house. He crashes at Planet Express, where Bender convinces him to live out his midlife crisis by extending his horns, buying a fast car, and going out with another Omicronian woman. She reveals herself to be a monster fetishist in a costume, and Lur gives up on Binder's plan, going with Leela and Fry's idea to actually listen to what Indend wants. They recruit the head of Orson Welles to put on a fake War of the Worlds broadcast that convinces Indend that Lur has successfully invaded a planet as per her wishes. But when she shows up to revel in the conquest, and Zap Brannigan surrenders to him for real, he realizes that he has no way of admitting the truth without making her mad. Eventually, though, the guilt gets to him and Ndn demands that he choose between her and Leela. Lur refuses to accept the ultimatum, but eventually caves in and shoots Leela, though Fry dives in the way of the beam. After they leave, it's revealed that the gun he used was simply a cheap teleportation ray, invented by Farnsworth, and the whole experience gives Fry the motivation to finish a comic he was writing. Since their time on The Simpsons, the writers of Futurama have always taken a sort of pleasure from eschewing the norms to genres that dominated television. This is typically done in the form of making fun of tropes that exist in adjacent genres, and this episode shows off the angle of direct parody, rather than a complete dismissal. A character undergoes a midlife crisis that results in a lack of interest in his career and a degradation of his relationship to his wife, something that one might see in any TV show. And here, the character is an alien, who not only has the career of conquering world, but has tried to conquer Earth on multiple occasions, a fact that's hardly consequential to the actual story. War of the Worlds is referenced in this episode, an old radio broadcast adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel that was so convincing that many people called their local police stations to report the alien invasion as panic gripped the streets. Or so the belief goes. 
The reality is that the broadcast began and ended with enough evidence of being an adaptation that no such reports were ever actually made. The belief that people believed a fake story enough to call the police on it was actually just a bit of clever advertising to show off how well written and narrated it was, like a movie promoting its special effect by claiming people believed it was real. But that was never the point. A person doesn't have to believe the story, they just need to think that the story is believable. Orson Welles never fooled anybody, but he fooled people into believing that they were fooled. The Mutants Are Revolting The Planet Express crew is celebrating their 100th episode, um, a delivery, a nitroglycerin cake to the wealthy Lady Astor, who meets Professor Farnsworth and offers to invite the whole crew to a charity ball of hers. While at this ball, she mentions her contribution to a mutant university in honor of her late husband, who died in the sinking of a massive bus, the Land Titanic. Leela's disgusted by the language she uses to describe these donations, and Fry accidentally outs her as a mutant herself. Leela is sentenced to return to the sewers with the other mutants, and the Planet Express crew tries to plead for her freedom, but then they're ordered to spend two weeks down there as punishment for harboring a mutant. Leela's mad at Fry for not being able to empathize with the plight of the mutants, so he dives into the sewage down there to become deformed, emerging as a blob of melted flesh. He and Leela then begin to lead the residents of Brown University in a rebellion, forcing the sewage back to the surface in a protest for their rights. This only results in the mayor of New New York doubling down on fighting back until the rest of the Planet Express crew discovers a crew log inside the wreckage of the Land Titanic. They tell about the way that Lady Astor's husband gave up his seat on a life bus to a mutant girl and implore Lady Astor to show the same kindness her late husband did. She agrees, only for the mutant of Mr. Astor to reveal himself as the blob surrounding Fry, and there's a happy ending for the rich people. Lady Astor is a philanthropist, much like the Astors of old New York and our world were known to be, but like many philanthropists, has a very one-sided idea of what these donations entail. While I don't want to make the claim that all charity is bad, charities might be ill-intentioned. Her donations are not out of a place of caring, but a place of making it look like she cares, while in reality she merely wants the pearls to be kept far away from her and her own. But Lady Astor is not the only performative activist here. The mutant rights movement uses violent activism and destruction of the surface to try to prove the point that they deserve equal treatment. And while there's a bit of irony from the fact that violently destroying the other half of the world is indeed a good way to show that you're no different, it's much better to try to elevate a mistreated group than to tear down the advantaged one. This is why the ending works, the revelation that Mr. Astor gave up his seat on the lifeboat for another, not because they were a mutant, but because they were a living being. This is, in case it wasn't obvious, the 100th episode of Futurama, and what better way to celebrate a long-running sci-fi series than to make an extended reference to one of the first science fiction films, Metropolis, known for being one of the most expensive movies produced relative to its time, and then afterwards destroyed by World War II and a lack of film preservation. Metropolis is a story that's about, well, basically the plot of this episode, I don't need to put a recap for the recap, but the inclusion of these tropes and plot beats is a sure sign that those working on Futurama aren't just casual fans of the science fiction tropes they parody, but enthusiasts of the history and the context behind the tropes in the first place. The Futurama Holiday Special a three-part holiday special showing the Planet Express crew celebrating three separate holidays prior to their painful death. In the first act, they try to celebrate Xmas, but the holiday doesn't feel right without a real pine tree, and pine trees have been extinct for centuries. So the crew goes to the Svalbard Sea Depository to try to revive the species, only for cross-contamination with the nearby Germ Warfare Depository to mutate the seeds that they grow. After Nixon's head steals the tree as a campaign stunt, the lighting ceremony turns into a disaster as the explosive seeds spread pine trees across the world, which results in the oxygen saturation of the planet becoming so high that Bender lighting a cigar blows everything up. The second act is about Robonica, where Bender tries to make up a few holiday traditions so it doesn't seem like he's just taking time off work. One of these traditions is a six and a half week long oil wrestling match but there's only enough oil to soak the fembots he hired for four and a half weeks. When Bender takes the Planet Express crew to a gas station to reload on oil, he discovers that the planet is out of it, so he sends them on a mission to the Earth's core to find more. 
but the pressure is too much and the ship collapses, only for Bender to realize, 50 million years later, that the remains of the crew have become oil. And when he returns to the surface with this oil, discovers that the Fimbots are still wrestling. A Robonica miracle. The third act covers Kwanzaa, with Kwanzaabot rapping a song about the unity that ends when he realizes that the candles are not authentic. So the Planet Express crew goes on a third fetch quest to find the beeswax that they need, only to learn that parasites have shut down all production. They then fly to the giant space bees from the episode The Sting to get more, only to find more parasites there as well. But when Hermes teaches the bees the meaning of Kwanzaa, the parasites die off and the bees are able to return to their hive mind, with their first act being to encase the Planet Express crew in wax and ignite them. The Silence of the Clamps The Planet Express crew delivers a new pair of clamps to Francis X. Clampazo during a Mafia wedding, and Bender decides to crash the wedding while he's there to be close to Calculon, and to sleep with the Dawnbot's daughter. But while making out in a stable, he witnesses the Dawnbot assaulting Calculon, and later testifies in front of a jury for the reward money. Calculon is threatened into confessing that his wounds were self-inflicted, and the robot mafia all walks free, so Bender has to go into hiding in the Witness Protection Program. Hoping to get their vengeance against Bender, the Dawnbot orders Clamps to sign up for Bender's old job, cozying up to Fry, and waiting for him to try to contact his old friend so they can clamp him. During a delivery, they happen upon a moon hillbilly who looks just like Bender, and they try to reunite with their old friend. But this man, who calls himself Billy West, doesn't recognize any of them. The professor scans his hard drive and finds no memory of the Planet Express crew, so they leave the new man to himself, only for Clamps to stay behind to finish the job. But Zoidberg follows him as he's jealous of his slicing duties being stolen, fighting, and eventually de-clamping the Mafia bot, before the mob boss's daughter shows up, angry that she was stood up, and she fatally shoots Billy West. Thinking Bender is dead, they go to a nearby pizza restaurant, only for one of the employees to reveal himself as the real Bender, and everyone celebrates that the dead hillbilly was just an innocent bystander. It's assumed that Bender's memory was wiped in this episode, and that having his memory wiped fundamentally altered who he was as a person. Just because his personality is altered isn't enough. Just because his life circumstances are different isn't enough. To really make Bender an unknown person is to have the memory of his friends wiped from existence. There's something to be said for the theory that Bender has done this a few times before, whether he's resetting around some penguins and adopting their personality, or he's resetting in a hall of criminals and getting the persona we know today. And while this memory as personality theory is slightly muddied by the fact that Bender is a robot and can have his memory erased and rewritten at will, the message of the episode still remains to an extent. But what also defines a person other than who they know is what they do, and when Clamps joins with Planet Express and begins to not only do Bender's own job but takes over Zoidbergs, this results in two characters having their positions taken away. And we see the extent to which these characters are willing to go in order to maintain their own lives, or to take them away. Francis not only threatens Bender's life, but his own livelihood. Mobius Dick The Planet Express crew is sent out to pick up and deliver a statue commemorating the death of the very first Planet Express crew, flying through the Bermuda Tetrahedron when Leela's obsession with ensuring the statue is perfect messes with their timetable. But while flying through, they come across a ship graveyard being haunted by a fourth dimensional space whale, and when it appears in front of them and eats the statue, Leela begins trying to get it back. She orders the crew to chase after the whale despite their injured ship until they're eventually consumed by it. The whale, that is. Once inside the belly of the beast, the crew is digested into a Mobius colon that recycles them through time and space, while Leela is absorbed into the whale's digestive tract, revealing that it feeds off senses of obsession, and has been using the old Planet Express captain as a fuel source in the last 50 years. Back at Planet Express, Zoidberg arrives in an escape pod, mirroring his return from the first mission and the resulting sci-fi trauma. The Lost Crew ceremony ends up being crashed by the space whale, with Leela stepping out and revealing that her obsession with finishing the delivery won out against her obsession with the whale, and everyone is reunited. Early stories about spacefaring have always borrowed heavily from old stories about ships and their captain, or rather, Star Trek does this in spades, and so it's an inevitability that the concept of a space whale would manifest as a plot device fitting for a series that is ostensibly about the open sea slash stars. And of course, 
There's the obvious reference to Moby Dick, one that barely needs being pointed out and is so thoroughly referenced within the plot of this episode that the tongue-in-cheek regurgitation of its messages and metaphors becomes a running joke in and of itself. So, of course, the space whale is a metaphor for whatever your high school teacher said it was, and Leela's obsession is a metaphor for... Uh, kind of stops there. At a point, the episode starts to lean further away from its influences and starts to become its own story, where the themes of revenge and obsession are retained, but the plot becomes about escaping a whale through sheer willpower. Not willpower to escape, but to finish a completely different task. Of course, all of this is predicated on Leela's character trait of always wanting to see her deliveries through, something that was informed by this episode as her desire to finish jobs was really only a trait she had in relation to the rest of the cast, a whole plot built around a flanderized trait. Law and Oracle Tired of the lack of respect he's getting and the fact that he's remained a delivery boy for over a thousand years, Fry looks for a job that will get him better status, and he signs up with the police after they solve a hostage situation at Planet Express. After a brief training period, Fry is assigned Earl as a partner, and they quickly work their way up the ranks as they bust criminals while looking cool. One of these promotions includes working alongside the Future Crimes Division, where a robotic oracle named Pickles predicts crimes before they happen, and the police arrest the suspect beforehand. But one of these predictions is about Bender stealing a bottle of Maltese liquor, with Fry shooting him afterwards. As Fry doesn't want to kill his friend, he decides that he will simply look the other way, which changes the future to one where Bender gets away with it, sharing the liquor with the rest of Planet Express, where the high alcohol content kills them. Realizing that he'll have to shoot his friend to save the others, Fry sets out to stop the burglary, only for Pickles to show up himself, announcing that he's tired of knowing everything all the time, and that he intends to use the liquor to poison the human part of his brain. But Fry turns this around, revealing that he knew the prediction was faked, as Bender would never share, and that the whole operation was a honeypot. In the end, he's fired from being an officer as he intended to let a criminal get away, and he's hired back at Planet Express with a phony new title. Once again, Futurama takes a beloved piece of culture and makes their own attempt at using the familiarity of its messaging to create a plot of their own. This is somewhat of a necessity of any high-concept science fiction story, as introducing and then executing a potentially complicated idea is something much more difficult to do in 22 minutes than in a feature-length movie. This is why something like the time-clone multiverses of Bender's Big Score are done in a TV movie, while the shorter episodes borrow from existing tropes. In this way, the Futurama writers are able to execute new ideas based off of existing franchises. Avid watchers will be able to pick up on the themes of Minority Report, whether they've read the book, seen the film adaptation, or even heard of the movie through cultural osmosis. And then the writers are able to use the established setting to springboard into a new story altogether. Law and Oracle is about Fry's friendship with Bender, the very reason he's so hesitant to stop a crime from being committed, while also being the thing that allows him to later determine Bender's innocence, as he knows his friend well enough to know that Bender would never share anything with anyone. Benderama The professor invents a machine that can duplicate an object into two smaller versions of itself as long as additional matter is added for the replication. He uses a sweater to show off the device and asks Bender to fold the new sweaters, only for Bender to make two clones of himself with the machine, so he doesn't have to do two things. On a later delivery to a self-conscious giant, the three Benders make fun of the guy, resulting in him losing his temper. When they return home, Bender wants four cigars, so his two mini-Benders make clones of themselves so they don't need to do two things each, and now there are seven Benders. Eventually, the Planet Express crew is set out to destroying these self-replicating Benders before they get out of hand, but Bender lets one get away, who proceeds to self-replicate into microscopic dust. The professor theorizes that they merely need to wait until all of the fuel source, alcohol, is consumed for the Benders to run dry but they simply manipulate the individual atoms in water to create their own, making the entire planet get completely wasted. Then the giant from before arrives to apologize, only to be insulted by the drunkards. He goes on a rampage, and no one's sober enough to fight him back, except for Bender himself, who calls on the dust of Benders to each do one quadrillionth of a thing. They wind up breaking down the giant molecule by molecule before leaving the planet, as they're too lazy to be called upon to do anything else. 
There's always pressure put on the creators of a TV show with any amount of success to find a marketable character and then to double down on their inclusion in as many plots as possible to maximize screen time. This ends up creating scenarios where, whenever that character is not on screen, all of the other characters ask, where's Bender? Putting so much emphasis on a single character typically also results in audiences growing sick of someone who was once so beloved, especially in a TV show with any amount of flanderization. The depth of the character becomes shallower, and they cannot support the amount of attention that they receive, resulting in the creation of scrappy doos and other obnoxious running plagues that were once franchise-carrying personalities. Of course, this same pressure was going to be made with Bender. He's the most recognizable character from Futurama, and the one who appears the most frequently in merchandising and advertising. So rather than slowly approaching a point where one character ruins the show for everyone else, the showrunners opted instead to accelerate this part of his future, show what a logical extreme to the over-Benderization of Futurama might look like, where the plot is caused entirely by Bender, and he's also the one to fix everything in the end. The Tip of the Zoidberg The episode begins with a flashback to Zoidberg's first encounter with Professor Farnsworth, where they're both working on a secret assignment for Mom to capture and harvest organs from a Tritonian Yeti. The two become fast friends, enough that when the rest of the crew all get a fatal illness from landing in the swamps, they set out together to finish the mission, and save each other's lives in the process before making a secret arrangement. Back in the present, the Planet Express crew all ends up mutilated in various ways through Zoidberg's ineptitude. After visiting a real doctor to get straightened out, they approach Zoidberg and an angry mob, demanding that he be let go from Planet Express. But before they can kick him out, the professor asks him to finish his side of their arrangement, to kill him if he ever shows signs of the disease he caught on Triton. When the Planet Express crew stops him in the middle of his mercy killing and learns the truth, they set up an elaborate Rube Goldberg machine with the intention of sharing in the guilt. But Zoidberg runs to Mom's to retrieve the organs they harvested back on Triton, negotiating with her by giving up a coupon for a free tan. He returns before the machine kills the Professor, and uses the Yeti's organs to cure the Professor's illness, Yetiism, destroying the machine in the process. When the Professor's life is no longer in danger, the crew goes out for tanning, with the Professor offering to pay for Zoidberg's. As a character, Zoidberg fits in with the rest of the cast. He's an incompetent doctor, but only when it comes to non-plot-related surgeries, giving just that ideal amount of zaniness to an otherwise also zany cast. But while the rest of Planet Express can get away with their various ineptitudes on the principle of being expendable delivery people, Zoidberg is meant to serve as a doctor, a job that can't really be bungled through in most cases. It's also questionable why a small firm needs a dedicated on-site professional medic other than trying to fix physical issues without legal trouble, and here we get a proper explanation. Zoidberg is a nepotism hire in the most optimistic implementation. Being hired to assassinate the professor rather than allowing him to suffer a horrendous fate while simultaneously explaining their mutual history and why Zoidberg is such a misplaced hire. We've seen that he actually knows what he's doing when he's operating on aliens, it's just humans he's bad at curing. So the idea that a doctor who is so bad he regularly loses patients, is actually an assassin meant to lose a patient, makes this backstory feel deserved if a bit contrived. Ghost in the Machines At a parade day parade, Fry dives in front of a runaway float, saving the life of a human and being recognized for it. Everybody is happy except Bender, who takes exception to the fact that Fry instinctively valued the life of a human more than that of a robot. When nobody else takes his complaints seriously, he decides to visit a suicide booth he used to date, where he's homicided to death. As it was technically self-inflicted, Bender does not leave Earth, but instead remains as a robot ghost. He makes a deal with the robot devil, that if he can scare Fry to death, he'll get his soul placed back in his body instead of being an incorporeal form for eternity. After discovering that he can haunt the bodies of any electronic device, Bender manages to make him suffer a near-death experience that results in Fry moving to the Amish planet as he's developed a fear of technology. But when saying goodbye to his friends, he gives one last lament that Bender is no longer around. So Bender decides not to scare Fry to death after all. But the robot devil wants his end of the bargain held up and comes to claim his due as Bender accidentally scares some animals who knock over a house that's about to crush Fry. 
Bender possesses the robot devil's body and saves Fry, getting sent to heaven where he harasses the robot god into sending him back home. Fry, like the rest of the crew, values the life of a human more than that of a robot, and much of the language of the season has effectively reinforced this idea. Robots, upon death, are uploaded into a cloud where they can be re-downloaded into a new body, assuming that they don't wind up in some sort of afterlife. With death having so little meaning, then it follows that life would also be less valuable. And yet, even with these caveats, a life can become more valuable if it's one that's close to us. For example, instinctively, one might argue that the life of an animal is less valuable than the life of a human. But most people, if they had to choose between the life of a pet or the life of a human stranger, would choose their pet in an instant. And far from being a pet, Bender is Fry's best friend, the first person to make him feel comfortable after arriving in the future, and, in spite of his callousness, the one person who's always viewed him as more than a comic relief character, at least relatively speaking. Bender hates all humans, he just hates Fry less. It's not until developing a fear of technology that he realizes how much Bender really meant to him. Just as Bender hates humans except for Fry, Fry hated machines that weren't Bender. Newtopia Planet Express is bankrupt and needs a way to make some quick money. The men of Planet Express suggest a girly calendar, though this idea fails as they only have three female employees, with LaBarbera being temporarily hired for the calendar. After that failure, they use Leela's idea to convert Planet Express into an airline, only for their converted airplane to crash when Fry falls asleep at the controls. They land on a planet inhabited by a rock alien, who wishes to test the crew by pitting the genders against one another. Neither group is successful in their challenge, and they even planned on stealing from one another to survive, with Hermes and LaBarbera discovering this plot and then making love after realizing. The alien rescues them and chastises them for failing at the task that was supposed to teach them cooperation, and then removes their sexes as the next phase of his experiment. Without sex or gender, they stop fighting and begin to repair the ship, though when Hermes and LaBarbera realize they can't make love anymore, they demand that they have it back. The alien, believing they've taught the humans the intended lesson, attempts to revert them back to their original sex, only to swap them by mistake. Before they can rectify this issue, they're destroyed, leaving the crew to return to Earth this way. But once again, the men demand the woman pose for a girly calendar, selling enough copies to save the company before a different rock alien fixes everything before flying away. As with most boys vs. girls plots on television, this episode has to exaggerate the differences between the sexes as well as making the characters much less amicable to one another, in order to make the plot work. Characters lose a bit of their usual personality to become a gender stereotype, so the writers can have an excuse to make fun of that gender stereotype, and this then makes for weak writing, as they're poking fun at something that's not usually there. But what this episode also pokes fun at is, you guessed it, Star Trek. The sheer number of TOS plots that involve the crew being kidnapped by some alien who makes them undergo an arbitrary trial that ostensibly is for research but in reality is a secret test of character, is something that makes itself very well known in a show that has already borrowed, if not outright stolen, so much more. But instead of the usual Kirk speech where a stoic captain calmly explains to the alien the misgiving of its ways and why humanity has moved on from obsessing with such petty squabbles, none of the cast here exists to serve that role, and as such, they wind up dealing with the consequences of their actions. Consequences that, again, exist because of exaggerations by the writers. Yo Leela 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 returns to the orphanarium where she was raised to read stories to the kids, but as they have no more books, she tries and fails to come up with one on the spot. Hoping to prove she can be creative, Leela finds a quiet place to write, away from the noise of Planet Express, and is soon able to create a script that catches the attention of Abner Doubleday, a children's TV executive, who gives her a contract to turn her stories into a kid's show. Leela's new show, Rumble Dee Hump, is a success, and soon wins a handful of awards and accolades, all of which go to her head as she starts to revel in her success. But when Bender stows away on the ship and discovers that Leela's quiet place is actually just a planet inhabited by humplings and that the scripts are just accounts of their daily lives, he starts extorting her for money to keep the secret. But when Leela later sees how much she's inspiring the orphans despite her success being based on a lie, she confesses the truth. 
so Abner Doubleday simply films the Humplings directly, adopting all the orphans to work as stage crew, and Leela lament that she isn't really taught a lesson. A pretty standard story in fiction is to have a character suddenly become rich, have their personality change suddenly, and then for them to lose it all and learn some kind of lesson from the experience as their poor friends take them back. It's also common to see characters gain something by cheating or lying, only to then lose it all when the secret's revealed. And this episode does neither of these morals, nor does it have any moral at all. Leela originally sets out to try to make the orphans happy with a story, and by the end of the episode, the orphans have steady jobs and parents. And while child labor is by no means a happy ending, if the alternative is life at the orphanarium eating books, then you take what you can get. Leela demands that she learn some lesson from the whole experience, that she ought to be punished to resolve her guilt of stealing stories from another planet. But most stories are, in some small way, adaptations of a person's real-life experiences or adaptations of existing tales. Writing down your observations of a group of aliens and turning it into a kid's entertainment is far from an immoral activity, to the point that when Abner Doubleday converts the planet into a reality show, the most evil thing about it is the fact that it's done as a cost-cutting measure. And all of this is after the creative voices involved are given a pay raise, albeit a minuscule one from nothing. Fry am the Eggman Tired of not knowing where their food comes from, Leela takes Fry and Bender to a farmer's market to do their shopping. But at a later breakfast, Fry is upset with the idea of eating an unborn baby, and decides to sit on one of the eggs Leela bought until it hatches, and then eat it. But as he's sitting on it, he grows more and more attached to whatever's inside, eventually deciding to name it Mr. Peppy and raise it as a pet. But Mr. Peppy's corrosive spit and hostile nature starts to freak out Planet Express, and upon researching to find out what species he is, they learn that he's a bone vampire, and formerly extinct. So Fry begrudgingly lets Mr. Peppy go free on his home planet, only for Bender to detect alcohol and the crew to take the time to go drinking. But the locals of Doohan 6 are shocked when they learn that Planet Express reintroduced the bone vampire to their planet, as they had to hunt the species to extinction for eating their livestock. Fry implores them to spare his pet until Mr. Peppy attacks Leela, so he takes matters into his own hands to put the beast down. But when they arrive to shoot him, Fry learns that it wasn't Mr. Peppy, but one of the locals in a costume deboning the sheep, but also that Mr. Peppy is very much also eating them. However, they ultimately decide to spare Mr. Peppy when the farmers acknowledge that they had too much livestock and that the bone vampire cleans them, expediting the rendering process. Fry here learns to appreciate the joys of motherhood, hatching an egg and growing attached to the hatchling as he starts to, like most new parents, overlook the flaws of their children and dismissing them as not that big of a deal. This denial can only last so long, but rather than playing the role of the disappointed father figure, he moves straight into acceptance, recognizing that the faults of his child are in the hands of the parent, even if the child is a bone-eating monster. So just as Fry blames himself for Mr. Peppy's behavior, he also takes it upon himself to be the one to fix the situation, rather than pushing the responsibility elsewhere. The other lesson taught in this episode comes from an environmental angle, criticizing the ways in which so many people will claim to love the Earth and all its creatures, but only the cute ones. Preservation is preservation, and sustainability comes in various forms, even some that aren't so glamorous. It's the right thing to do to try to introduce the bone vampire into its natural habitat, after it's been hunted to extinction as a result of a man showing off his machismo. Just because they look like monsters doesn't mean that they don't still serve an important role, like mosquitoes being valuable pollinators, despite also carrying disease. And from the other side of the issue, hunting is not an inherent evil either. The people of Doohan 6 have ballooned the number of sheep on the planet far beyond a sustainable amount, lamenting the damage they themselves have introduced into the ecosystem. So it becomes a necessity to control but not eliminate the population of bone vampires to offset the human factor in nature, even if some people still take offense to hunting. All the President's Heads Fry is working his night job at the Head Museum and gets pressured into throwing a party with all the President's Heads. While partying, Zoidberg discovers that licking the fluid that heads are preserved in causes anyone nearby to be sent back to the time of that historical figure and Farnsworth learns that one of his ancestors was a notorious traitor to the American Revolution. So he uses that first fact to attempt to remedy the second one, 
tracking down his ancestor with the help of Benjamin Franklin, and uncovering his counterfeiting racket. Hoping to stop him from trashing the early American economy, they beat David Farnsworth with a candlestick. Then, they burn all of his fake money with a lantern that turned out to be one of the warning signs of the impending British invasion, making Paul Revere's midnight ride deliver false information, and letting the British army catch the revolutionaries off guard. When they return to the present, the crew of Planet Express find themselves engaged with British aphorisms, culture, and cuisine, as the American Revolution never happened. Likewise, David Farnsworth is now considered a national hero for his efforts in stopping the revolution, and the professor is notoriously wealthy from inheritance. But when he discovers his new relationship to the queen, he decides to steal her crown to use the jewels to go back in time again, setting everything more or less right. The Futurama approach to science is applied to history here, where realism takes a backseat to whatever is interesting on a macro perspective, while just enough facts are thrown in, in the interest of maintaining a believable connection to our world. For example, a mind-switching device does not really exist, but the mathematical proof that resolves the conflict is solid, and that realism is what elevates the rest of the plot. Here, the crew of Planet Express goes back in time to clear the Farnsworth name, only to meet the Founding Fathers and eventually try to overcome the efforts of a close ally of Paul Revere, David Farnsworth, who was a real person who actually tried to crash the wartime economy of the early US by flooding the markets with counterfeits. So just as Futurama borrows from the science when it needs to add to the story and makes things up when it needs to, it does the same thing with history. The Founding Fathers are portrayed with a surprising amount of realism, from Ben Franklin's womanizing to the fallibility of many of the other men who are so idolized. But rather than this being an indictment of the first years of US history, it serves to make the events of this historical story better. That America's forefathers were not the larger-than-life figures they're portrayed as, but just as flawed and relatable as anyone alive today, or a thousand years from now. Cold Warriors The episode flashes back to Fry as a teenager, going ice fishing with his father where he falls into the ice and then falls ill. As he's recovering, he gets a flyer for a science fair that he enters, hoping to send his guinea pig into space after infecting it with his cold. But his father derides the project, saying that the project of a local nerd is much more likely to win, in spite of that project being copied partially from Fry's work. Back in the future, Fry catches cold while ice fishing again, and the rest of Planet Express is horrified to learn of this, as the common cold was wiped out five centuries ago, and humanity has lost its resistance to it. Zap Brannigan and Nixon work together to quarantine Planet Express before they infect the rest of the world, but Bender escapes confinement, and the common cold begins to spread. So they resort to a plan to quarantine Manhattan and launch it into the sun. But when Fry remembers his old science fair project, he sets out with the rest of Planet Express to retrieve a sample of the virus from a satellite graveyard, stumbling upon the old NASA satellite where they find the other kid's project. Fry knew his project didn't make it, and the whole flashback sequence is revealed as a framing device for Fry's father justifying why he's so hard on his son, so he can grow up tougher. They say that if you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for the rest of his life. But in this metaphor, it's probably easier to consider that it's very difficult to teach a man how to fish when he's starving. Fry's father never shows him any affection, remaining aloof and constantly denigrating any of his son's attempts at learning or fostering a hobby. One wonders if he would have amounted to anything more than a delivery boy if any of his attempts at pursuing a scientific interest was met with encouragement instead of deriding failures. Failures that are an inevitability to anyone starting out with anything. This episode also answers one of the inevitable questions associated with Futurama's premise, interestingly from the opposite end of the spectrum, specifically how a person from the past can survive after 1,000 years of antibiotic resistances and human immunities, whether that was done through one of the various probing exams in the first episode, as well as answering how it got to that point in the first place. The pandemic response of the future is one that's overbearing and quick to action, though thinking logically, this is the side of an issue one would want to err on, if any, it's better to overreact to a potential contagion and suffer a small early loss than to wait too long and suffer a much larger, more devastating one, both in life and economically, as we all learned just a few years ago. At least most of us. Overclockwise 
To make him better at video games, Qbert overclocks Binder's processor to improve his reaction times, and the two are able to beat their internet rivals, revealed as the three sons of Mom. When she identifies what she believes to be a cheater in an online game, she learns that it's one of her bending units and that he's been illegally altered. So the police are dispatched to arrest Qbert, grabbing Farnsworth in the process, much to Mom's excitement at being able to legally destroy one of her enemies. It's illegal to modify Mom's robotics, as she suspects that nobody will buy her new models if they can simply improve the old ones, and she has people sign a legally binding EULA to prevent this. She also wants to remove the modifications from Bender, who they can't find, as he used his overclocked brain to start to modify himself to have more processing power, eventually becoming so intelligent that he abandons Fry as he finds human squabbles beneath him. Leela has also abandoned Fry, as she was feeling trapped in what she thought was a dead-end relationship, going off into the galaxy to sell real estate. With Planet Express nearing bankruptcy and everybody he's close to being gone, Fry tries to track down Bender, stumbling upon him by chance as he's using Niagara Falls as both a generator and water cooler. Bender takes pity on him and sets out to end the court case, convincing Mom to drop the charges against Qbert by convincing her that a jury would not convict a child, and then freeing the professor as Qbert is a clone and one cannot be tried for the same crime twice. At the courthouse, Bender is then apprehended and factory reset, with everything returning to normal including Fry's relationship with Leela because she couldn't stay gone. At the end of the episode, we get to watch Fry and Leela react to the future of their relationship, reading through an unseen printout of every major event in their relationship, presumably up until the very end. All we get out of this prediction are the expressions that they make in reaction to the future. While this feels like a poor sort of cop-out to a show that they learn of their future without sharing it with the audience, it would be much worse had they simply read it aloud, to spoil everything for us instead. Of course, the real reason this was done was the fact that this episode could have been the final episode of the show. As usual, Futurama was always on shaky ground when it came to knowing about their future, so they have to make each season's storyline end with something that would have to, at once, serve as a satisfying conclusion without being too conclusive, lest they eliminate any sort of tension for the future. But it's not like we were denied any information about the future of Fry and Leela after all. We got to see a confused Leela flee a relationship she saw going nowhere, only to realize she was unhappy separate from Fry and returning. And we saw Fry go through extreme lengths, not only in tracking down Binder or in hoping to return to the way things were. He threatens to jump off a high waterfall if he can't live his own life with the same people. Something that could have possibly been a contributing factor as to why Leela left in the first place. But Fry knows that he can't change. Binder gives up near omnipotence to be back in his old life, and even Leela returns in the end, a sign that their future is more likely going to be the same as their past. Reincarnation A three-part episode showing various stylizations of the Planet Express crew. The first is a black-and-white throwback to early cartoon stylizations, where Fry is lamenting that he doesn't have the decent way of proposing to Leela. But when the professor asks them to harvest Comet Runoff for a Doomsday device, Fry gets the idea to sneak away and harvest a bit of diamond from the Comet itself. He fails to break any of it off, and then changes his plan, simply detonating the Doomsday device to blow up the Comet in the sky. As it explodes, it creates a rainbow that includes a brand new color, something we don't get to see due to the sky being black and white, something that he also dedicates to Leela to show his affection. In the end, the crystals from the raining comet shower down onto their proposal, locking them into that moment for billions of years. The next part of the episode uses 8-bit stylization, or at least occasionally, as the crew of Planet Express observes the professor unveiling his newest invention, a lens made from the crystals harvested from the comet in the last part. Using this lens, he's able to zoom in dramatically onto some matter, zooming past so many other obfuscations before discovering the root of all matter, the pixel. After doing a bit of quick maths to support his finding, he reveals that there is no more science left to discover, as all the laws of physics have now been solved. This revelation depresses him, as without any more mysteries, the world becomes a boring place, and his life lacks meaning. That is, until the professor starts to ask why the laws of physics are the way they are, instead of some other way, and finds new meaning in uncovering these new mysteries. The third act is stylized as 90s Japanese anime, with the crew speaking as though their dialogue was directly translated from Japanese. A race of aliens who worship the comet from part 1 discovers it's been destroyed, and heads to Earth to meet with the people who killed their god. 
but these aliens don't have mouths and do not understand speech, on top of being much more powerful than the forces of Earth, making both violence and diplomacy worthless. Fry and Bender attempt to use dance to convince them of Earth's peaceful intentions, but their movements are too rigid to get this point across, until Zoidberg steps up, shedding his shell to use his curves to convince the aliens not to fight. In the end, they are impressed enough by his dance to return home without any further violence. Season 7 Like Season 6 before it, Season 7 was split between its first and second halves for broadcast, as well as having a few episodes airing out of order for promotional reasons. Between the first and second halves of this season, Comedy Central announced that the show would not be renewed, and that the next 13 episodes would be the last, giving the writers a fourth chance to wrap everything up with the episode Meanwhile. But aside from these fun facts, Season 7 is hardly different from Season 6, with the exception of airing a year later, and thus having some of the more referential episodes dated to that time instead of before. The Bots and the Bees The Professor unveils a new addition to Planet Express, a soda machine controlled by a robot named Bev. Bev dispenses a new form of slurm that Fry becomes addicted to, drinking so much of it that his skin starts to glow bright green. She also frequently argues with Bender, culminating in her scaring off a few of his floozies before they start a fight that ends with the two making love. Later, Bender dispenses a tiny bot that looks just like Bender, who he names Ben, but he's not happy about the idea of being a father. So Bender tries to officially abandon his son, only for Bev to abandon him first. Bender winds up caring for the kid, soon learning that he enjoys watching Bender bend things, and that he wants to be a bending unit himself one day. But he can't follow this dream, as he only has one memory slot, and that it's currently being used for his memory. Bender tries to encourage his son to lead a healthy life anyway, but on the day of his bot mitzvah, Bev reappears and uses Bender's earlier degree of abandonment to take Ben away. Undeterred, Bender tries to kidnap Ben and flee from the police together, but when Bender injures his arms and can't bend, it's up to Ben to try to bend a grate to get them to safety. He fails, but Bev abandons them once again and she has another child with the pursuing officers. When Ben is upset about his failure to bend, Bender asks the professor to remove all of his memories of his father to make room for a new bending card, and with Fry's help, they're able to get him to bend in college before the registration deadline. Bender hates everybody but himself, and he really likes himself. Here we get to see the one way that Bender can really like someone other than him, if that person is basically him as well. He got along with Flexo for a while, and then he got along with Ben, as Ben was just a little version of Bender. So when Ben announced that he wanted to be more like his father, Bender set out to help him make that dream come true, in spite of the act being selfless. Because Bender would want other people to hurt themselves for his sake, so he's willing to hurt himself for the sake of someone like him. But in reality, the main reason Bender was so accepting of his son for getting his face and accomplishments was the fact that, had he not done so, there would have to be another character introduced to the cast, permanently. The same thing applies to Bev that she has to be nothing but a fling for Bender, lest he grow attached and the writers would have to add to the dynamic. Sure, many shows make attempts at maintaining popularity in their later seasons by arbitrarily introducing a baby and the like to the cast, and this is the first episode of season 7, so what better time to do so? But this is an action done by shows that are fading out of the popular consciousness and desperate, and Futurama, despite making it past 100 episodes a while ago, is not close to that point. A Farewell to Arms While chasing after a gopher that's stolen his lucky pants, Fry stumbles upon a series of tunnels beneath New New York. After his gentlemanly offers wind up injuring Leela yet again, they notice an ancient Martian pyramid with a large stone calendar predicting the end of the world. As the sun begins to produce more and more solar flares, people start to plan to evacuate the planet, only for sunspots to serve as an EMP, preventing anything electric from working. But when the pyramid is revealed to actually be a spaceship with a capacity of 30,000, the Earth government starts to plan who deserves to live and who will stay behind. Due to her injury, and the fact that only one pilot is needed, Leela is chosen to stay on Earth while Fry gets added to the ship because of his lucky pants. But Fry, wanting Leela to live, modifies his ticket to have her face on it, staying behind so Leela can survive. However, 
Upon landing on Mars and dismantling the ship to make a new society, a native Martian returning for his stuff reveals that the planet predicted to be destroyed by the prophecy was actually Mars, not Earth. With no way to escape, the survivors are helpless against the solar flares igniting gas pockets underneath the surface, which launches Mars into Earth's gravity. The planets pass close enough that most people are simply able to jump the gap, but Leela can't due to her injury, so Fry offers his hand, with his and her arm being detached by the Force, before Scruffy saves Leela off screen, and the Professor simply grows them new arms. This episode draws from the alleged Mayan Apocalypse from 2012, the date in which the Mayan calendar ended, and thus, the date that many believe the Mayans predicted that the world would end. Of course, the truth is that the Earth, spoiler alert, did not end in 2012. Additionally, the Mayans did not truthfully believe the Earth would end at this time. The major thing that would happen in the year 2012 is that the Mayans would have to build a new calendar. They used a base 20 over base 18 system that simply happened to end in that year, and the apocalypse theory never had any true validity outside of facetious joking that some took far too seriously. Had the conquistadors not so thoroughly pillaged the new world, this would have been a more widely acknowledged fact, mirroring the destruction of the native Martian population in Futurama setting. Fry through this episode persists in ruining things for Leela every time he tries to make things better for her. Between falling into open sewers, breaking her leg, and later losing the assumed ticket off the dying earth, Leela has a very little reason to trust Fry when he asks her to take his hand at the episode's climax. And yet she does anyway. This is a strong sign of the love they share, that Leela judges Fry off of his intentions with her instead of the end result of those intentions. She knows he means well and thus thinks that of him not viewing the relationship as purely transactional. Decision 3012 Nixon runs for re-election, offering free beer as a bribe to constituents as well as demanding a Dyson fence be built around the planet to stop aliens from working on Earth. He leads in the polls, miles ahead of a reasonable candidate named Chris Travers, who Leela takes notice of offering to run his campaign for him. She's able to turn him into a frontrunner, so Nixon recruits the help of Bender to find dirt on the guy. But Bender can't find anything on him and decides to instead come up with a false accusation, claiming that he wasn't born on Earth and thus is ineligible to be president. Travers refuses to acknowledge the frivolous claim, but due to the mob of yokels doubling down on the fake controversy, Leela goes out of her way to find his birth certificate from the hospital he listed as his birthplace. But when she arrives, she discovers no birth certificate under his last name, only an admission to the maternity ward. Travers arrives at the hospital, revealing that he's from Earth, years into the future. He was sent back in time to defeat Nixon after his terrible policies drove the world into starvation, with the Soylent majority being ground into food as robots took over. So Leela plans to televise Travers' birth to prove he will be from Earth, silencing the skeptics and causing Travers to win the Earth elections, but before he can be sworn in, he vanishes from reality, as the conditions to send him back in time never happened, and thus, Nixon wins once again. This episode lampoons the birtherism movement that briefly became a talking point within U.S. politics, in which opponents to a presidential candidate questioned the validity of that candidate by refusing to believe he was from the U.S., and therefore not legally able to be president. This, of course, wound up amounting to nothing but manufactured conflict against a candidate with too little of a background to dig dirt out of. As such, it was not a movement based on facts, data, or even an emotional belief. It was a reason to get angry and yell at someone because you disagreed with them. By refusing to accept where the burden of proof for a claim is, a group can then argue forever, claiming that their questions aren't being answered because they weren't paying attention when the data was presented. But in the optimism of Futurama, presenting proof of a statement, regardless of the exceedingly high standards of proof that there were, is enough to convince the voter base of the truth. But this still doesn't succeed, as once the issues are voted out of office, the conditions that got people so concerned and politically involved were gone. And then people got content and lazy with the status quo. It's like someone with a hole in the roof of their house who doesn't fix it because, when it's raining, it's too wet to work, and while it's sunny, the hole's not a problem. So long as life continues on as normal, people tend to get lazy, and they turn a blind eye to minor injustices, only bothering to do something about these injustices once they're personally affected. But by then, who's left to fight for you? The Thief of Baghead 
Planet Express goes to the aquarium, where Bender repeatedly tries to take photos on film before seeing Calculon and leaving to take photos of him instead. He gets so many invasive photos that Zoidberg suggests that he take them to a celebrity gossip magazine, impressing the boss there enough to get a job as a full-time paparazzo. Bender succeeds at this job, but wants to prove his skills by getting a picture of an actor named Langdon Cobb, who always keeps his face covered by a bag. Bender is able to get past his guard fungus and snaps a picture, only to develop this photo and realize that it drains the soul, or life force, out of anybody who sees it. The professor informs Bender that Langdon is an alien who lives off of life forces that he steals by showing people his face, but that he can also feed off of attention, which manifests by making his quantum entangled other half, the guard fungus, grow larger. So they plan on ambushing his ego during an acting competition, helping Calculon to win the contest by actually poisoning him during a death scene, and then striking. But despite Calculon dying for real, Langdon Cobb still wins the competition, and his ego grows so large it starts to attack the rest of the crew. Bender gets the idea to simply show Langdon a picture of himself, as he still has the negatives, but this plan fails as he's immune to his own effects until he starts to admire the picture so much that his ego explodes, returning everybody's soul or er, life forces to their body. Langdon Cobb, as well as Binder, are on opposite sides of a large-scale parasocial relationship, the mass-scale obsession people have with celebrities, specifically their personal lives. Those with few close personal relationships often wind up trying to supplement their lack of affection by offsetting the difference onto strangers that they imagine are their friends. Bender is obsessed with Calculon, but Calculon is barely aware of Bender's existence, despite the fact that he really ought to be more aware by this point. And then this parasocial relationship ends up affecting the celebrities on the other end of it, as paparazzi, or today social media, ensures that every waking moment of their private life ends up being public, and this public worship tends to make them feel as though they're much more important than they are, then leading to bizarre behavior. Or rather, it puts this bizarre behavior onto a pedestal, where it's put up to more scrutiny as well as idolization. In reality, celebrities are hardly more strange than an average person. Their unique strangeness just happens to be broadcast to a larger and more critical audience than the layperson will ever comprehend. Our own weird habits tend to be kept to ourselves, but if a random person were suddenly made into a celebrity and their private life was a public life, they would no doubt be just as criticized. In turn, people who find themselves as public figures often end up making a more active effort to surround themselves with those who think like they do, or those who idolize them, to offset the extra scrutiny, and thus, the career creates narcissists. Zap Dingbat Leela's parents, Munda and Morris, get into an argument about Morris being too unadventurous in their 40 years of marriage, and their argument turns into a divorce, with Munda living alongside Leela until she can find somewhere else to live. While being out on the town for the first time in decades, Munda meets Zap Brannigan, using her skills with foreign languages to defuse a situation where Zap accidentally insulted the Carcerones in their native language. After this, the two start to date much to Leela's disgust and suspicion that Zap is merely getting together with Leela's mother to make her jealous. She tries to get her father to help her investigate slash sabotage the relationship, but he's too mellowed out after having gotten back into sewer surfing to care. Eventually, Zap proposes to Munda, with their wedding being interrupted by the Carcerons, eager to sign the peace treaty. But when Zap reveals to Munda, his translator, that he actually plans on using the phony peace treaty as a pretext to war, she calls off the wedding and treaty both, with the Carcerons attacking anyway. But Morris stowed away on the ship, planning to interrupt the wedding, as he's gotten over his inner peace and wants to win her back, something he does by surfing the Nimbus out of the way of their attacks before Munda is able to teach Zap enough of the alien's language to apologize. And in the end, Leela's parents get back together. Munda and Morris are mutants who have only just recently earned the right to live above the surface about half a season ago. But after 39 years of marriage without exercising this right, they've grown stagnant and used to not leaving the sewers. But just because you can't do something doesn't mean that you don't want to, nor does it necessarily imply that you do. Munda and Morris feel both of these extremes, but don't communicate them, so the last time they ever had to consider if their relationship gave them more or less freedom was at the very beginning of it where the answer was yes. Munda just wanted to go out and explore the galaxy, while Morris wanted to stay beneath the surface to surf various waves. They didn't live out either of these dreams as they were busy with their spouse who did not share them. 
This comes across as a sacrifice, but only when you take the angle that one must spend all of their free time alongside whoever they're married to. The couple divorces, and in doing so, gets the first alone time they've had in decades. But after switching from one extreme to another, they start to understand what advantages their old life had. Maybe the two didn't need to spend every single waking moment with one another, and would have been happier with a bit of space, that space being something that they got, and then massively overshot to the point that they slung back to where they began. The Butter Junk Effect While making a delivery to the moon, the Planet Express crew visits a butterfly derby, where women in skimpy costumes fight each other until one group falls to the ground. Leela and Amy enter an amateur bout, and despite losing, are brought on to compete full-time. But they still don't find any success until they're approached in the locker room with Nectar, a semi-addictive substance that serves to make its users stronger in the wing-flapping regions. Amy and Leela are able to turn their losing streak around, but also become much more aggressive in the process, constantly attacking their respective boyfriends as they become more and more dependent on Nectar. But when their opponents buy out the last of the batch, they set out to Kif's homeworld to track down more, and while there, Fry is sprayed by the pheromones of the butterfly that helps to create it. These pheromones result in Fry being irresistibly attractive to anyone taking Nectar, resulting in Amy and Leela fighting over him. But after fighting for a while, they mutually decide to quit Nectar, getting over their addictions and obsession with Fry. They then attend their final match and are nearly killed during the fighting until a mutated Fry hatches from a cocoon and enters the arena, attracting the nectar opposing team and saving the others from death. In the end, Fry eventually molds his butterfly form as Amy and Leela are thankful not to be addicted to anything anymore. The overt messaging in this episode is all about steroid usage in professional sports, but at no point in the episode is nectar ever explained as being illegal or banned. At most, its use is frowned upon, and at the least, it's considered an enhancement to the entertainment of the audience, as it causes the athletes to become better, faster, and stronger, despite being at the expense of their mental health. Amy and Leela start to become more aggressive husband feeders, unaware of the mental changes as they focus so heavily on the physical ones. And so an episode that is not about steroids is actually about steroids, but used not to represent the athletic controversies of substance abuse, but the mental ones. Real-world athletes frequently suffer multiple concussions, resulting in violent tendencies that often become overlooked as the leagues that hire these athletes don't want to risk the entertainment of the games, even if it is to preserve the health of those participating. Amy and Leela put themselves at risk by consuming the nectar, despite the substance use being standard procedure. But as it's common practice to prioritize entertainment over safety, ruining a handful of lives is but a small price to pay. The Six Million Dollar Mon Hermes does a performance review of everyone at Planet Express, and decides to fire the worst performing employee, himself, as he's wasted too much time doing performance reviews. While out with his wife at the park, they're attacked by Roberto, though he's apprehended by the police and given the electromagnetic chair. Hermes starts to feel inadequate about this, and finds a back alley doctor to give him a grappling hook inside his chest, and later on an extending robotic arm. Despite Hermes getting his job back, Zoidberg starts to feel concerned about this change, eventually salvaging the human parts Hermes had removed to create a puppet for his comedy act slash for companionship. After an argument with La Barbara about his lack of emotions, Hermes decides to finally replace the last part of him that's still human, his brain, so he won't feel so bad about being a robot. But only the professor is crazy enough to perform robot brain surgery, and so the two dig up a recently killed robot to get an implant. That robot happens to be Roberto, who, now back from the dead, starts to skin Hermes, whose human brain was placed into Zoidberg's puppet, in order to eat him. But upon taking the first bite, Roberto melts as years of LaBarbera's cooking has made Hermes too spicy. Now back to normal, more or less, Hermes apologizes to Zoidberg, who takes a chance to tell off Hermes for not appreciating what he has. The story of the ship of Theseus is a story of a ship getting replaced piece by piece until there's nothing left of it as every single piece is now new. Then, the old pieces are gathered up and put together exactly as they were before. As a result, both ships can be considered the original due to the continuity of service and continuity of material. This philosophical question is approached and then answered by this episode of Futurama, as Hermes replaces each part of his body individually until being put back together by Zoidberg after a total replacement has been made. 
The Hermes puppet is never considered to be Hermes properly until the last piece is placed inside. Prior to that, he's just a prop used in a comedy act. Part of this can be attributed to the fact that he's not yet complete. A fundamental part of him is gone, and so he cannot be considered the real Hermes. And this fundamental part happens to also be the last thing taken from the robot Hermes, the brain. Everyone treats Hermes like Hermes, even his wife getting upset with him for his decisions without accepting his deflections regarding the fact that he's losing more and more of himself in the process. So to answer the question of which is the original, Futurama takes the side of whichever body carries the spirit of the original, in this case, the ship that has remained in service under the original name. Fun on a bun. The Planet Express crew goes to Oktoberfest to unwind, but Fry's appalled by the fact that, over the centuries, Oktoberfest has been changed to a sophisticated showing of culture. Fry tries to get belligerently drunk in spite of this and embarrasses Leela, who calls him a brute and breaks up with him. Meanwhile, Bender attempts to win a sausage-making competition by making sausage from the rarest animal he can find, a preserved woolly mammoth. But while processing the meat, a drunken Fry falls into the grinder and bits of his hair and clothes are later found inside of the sausage that Bender made, which Leela eats after Bender's meat makes it to the next round. Horrified that she's eaten her ex-boyfriend, Leela goes to a forgetfulness center to have her memories of Fry disconnected from her brain, completely forgetting everything about the guy. The crew tries not to remind Leela of her grief as they return to Oktoberfest, where they end up being overrun by Neanderthals. As it turns out, Fry did not get crowned into sausage, but fell through the ice, discovering a group of buried Neanderthals who have lived in resentment of the surface dwellers for thousands of years. They accept Fry as one of their own due to his head injury, and he leads them in a rebellion against the technology of the future, or the present. But as he and Leela are fighting, the two suddenly recognize one another and begin to kiss, which inspires the rest of the attendees to follow suit, and they all celebrate an old-fashioned, low-brow Oktoberfest. The major conflict of this episode comes down to the brutish, uninhibited lifestyle of Fry and the Neanderthals versus the stuck-up and refined lifestyle of the socialites at Oktoberfest a conflict that is as one-sided as it is contrived. Obviously, if asked to choose between a pre-industrial world and one that has access to anesthetics and penicillin, I choose the one that's slightly less fun. What also makes the plot contrived is the fact that the future folk are constant reflections of our own world, and thus, not really the stuck-up stereotypes that they have to be for this episode's plot. But it's not as though the world of Futurama has ever been especially concerned with making plots like this make sense, as long as there's humor that can be found. Given a double justification in this plot, as the sight of Zap's incompetence with the woolly mammoths overpowering dark matter engines with their tusks backs up one side. But more than a silly plot about cavemen beating up spacemen, this episode shows the strength of the relationship between Fry and Leela, with Leela overreacting to Fry's antics and immediately regretting that she loses the ability to make her peace with him, while Fry becomes angry, forgets why he's angry, and then takes out this misguided anger on the surface dweller that he only just learned about. But despite these two totally separate paths, all that it takes for them to recall their love is to see each other once more. Two characters with amnesia fall in love once again, to prove that the first time wasn't a fluke. Free Will Hunting Getting accosted for wearing nerd glasses results in Bender enrolling in college, involving himself with a bad crowd, and eventually falling into a desperate spiral of addiction, violence, and prostitution. He gets sent to court, but is not considered guilty of anything, as he's a robot and can't consciously make a decision, only to follow his programming. Upset about not having any free will, Bender sets out to mope around the robot homeworlds until he wanders aimlessly into a monastery. The monks there teach Bender that, although they cannot change the path they take through life, they can adapt to it and change the way they think about it, until one of the monks tells them that their empty, free will adapter exists. Bender breaks into Mom's friendly robot company to investigate the existence of the free will unit and learns that Farnsworth made one but hid it away as he feared what Mom might do with it. So Bender demands that the professor hand it over, although the professor tells him that robots are programmed not to pick up the device, nor can they injure the professor without one. But he feels sorry for the bot and places it inside his brain anyway, warning about the fact that, due to the quantum nature of the device, it's impossible to know whether or not it's on. So Bender simply checks both states and shoots the professor as a test, getting tried and eventually found guilty to the celebration of the whole crew. 
Speaking literally, it's unknown if humans have free will, let alone robots. We could easily be sacks of flesh that react to electrical input based on past experience, all of which can be traced back to residual inertia from the single chemical reaction theorized as the Big Bang. By this definition, no human truly has free will at all, and all actions that occur in the universe are preordained. And yet, in the chaos of so many esoteric particles bouncing around, it's impossible to actually understand the cause and effect of such actions, resulting in a world with free will being fundamentally identical to a world without it. This is even a concept played within the episode, with the professor insinuating that the on-off switch being unlabeled plays into the idea that we never truly know, at least until we're shot by a robot. This is a concept played within many early science fiction stories, such as Isaac Asimov's Foundation. The idea is that, while humans are unpredictable on a person-by-person -person basis, large groups of people behave in measurable and predictable ways, so large-scale societal changes are more or less inevitabilities we're powerless to affect most of the time. This is the philosophy of the robots in the monastery, that while they can't affect their programming, they can affect their thoughts and reactions, and that perhaps these small changes in mentality can end up recontextualizing the world in such a way as to influence it after all. Near Death Witch Fry gets a Delivery Boy award and tries to dedicate it to his family, but Farnsworth didn't show up to the ceremony, so he gets mad and finds another relative instead. He discovers Ned and Velma Farnsworth living on the Near Death Star, and heads to their virtual retirement home to visit for a time. He gets along with them well, ultimately breaking them out by mistake and taking them back to Planet Express only for the professor to be upset about their visitation. After some moping, he reveals why. Ned and Velma never seemed to have time to play with him or support his scientific interests, and when he got accepted to MIT, they instead took him to live on a farm. He ran away from that farm and hasn't seen them since. After failing to make his peace with them in the present, Farnsworth runs away again, with Fry, Bender, and Leela tracking him down to the farm he was raised on, taking Ned and Velma there as well to try to talk him out of it. The professor's parents explain the truth, that Hubert Farnsworth was the younger of two brothers, the older of whom was deeply troubled, requiring his parents to stay up all night reading to him so he could sleep, eventually going crazy and getting checked into a mental institution. But after they misname him, the further truth is revealed. Hubert Farnsworth was the older brother, and his resentment for his parents came from the fact that they put him in the institution. Feeling sorry about the whole misunderstanding, he modifies their virtual retirement home to resemble the farm, and the family plays together one more time. There's a saying, the axe forgets, but the tree remembers. It's often used to describe the relationship one has with their parents, and how the perception that the parents have of the relationship can differ from how it's viewed by the child. Farnsworth naturally had no idea he was being read to every night. The only part of his childhood that he remembered were the parts where his waking hours were ignored. Likewise, many details of child rearing can often be overlooked due to parents putting more of an effort into the less visible aspects of taking care of a kid. Kids don't often make the connection between a parent working and their quality of life, so even if a parent is logging extra hours to ensure their child has more opportunities, the kid only sees that the adults in their life weren't around very often. But this is far from an excuse to forgive mistakes by parents, as the only ones who can ask for forgiveness are the people who made the mistake in the first place. Farnsworth's parents were doing what they viewed as the right thing, keeping a mentally unstable teenager away from a lifestyle that would have hurt him even more. But where they messed up was not in their actions, but in how they justified them, or rather, how they didn't. It took nearly 150 years before the Farnsworth parents finally explained to their child why they acted how they did, and that's all it would have taken to make peace instead of silently living in resentment in a virtual retirement home. Thirty-first Century Fox After their uniforms are destroyed, Planet Express goes to a tailor to buy new ones, and Bender sees a fox hunting outfit that he enjoys. Hoping to break the uniform in, he goes out to a fox hunt, much to Leela's annoyance that she takes exception to the idea of hunting for sport. They trek through the trap-laden woods until coming across the dead fox, where it's revealed that the fox was robotic all along. Leela is now fine with this, but it's Bender who's upset as he believes that a robot is being harmed unnecessarily. So he makes a protest group, BARF, to free robots from unnatural oppression before setting his sights once more on the fox hunt swapping places with the fox to rub it into the hunters that he freed the animal. 
but the Master of the Hunt simply changes the event to hunt Binder instead, and the robot is chased through the woods, coming across many of the traps before getting caught in one. Meanwhile, the freed fox is adopted by Planet Express until it starts to tear things up, including Amy's chicken, Fry's face, and Leela's signs. So they chase it away and it heads back to its habitat, freeing Bender from the snare. Bender is then able to set his own trap for the master of the hunt, choosing not to shoot him as it isn't sporting, until the fox returns and attacks the hunt master, also revealed to be a robot. In the end, Leela and Bender decide that robot-on-robot -robot violence isn't actually that bad, as they have other things to care about. Leela takes issue with the fact that a flesh-and-blood creature is being hunted for sport, until discovering that it's actually a robot and promptly ceasing to care. Bender has no problem with hunting a flesh-and-blood creature until discovering that it's a robot, at which point he has a problem with it and starts an activist group to protect its rights. And these opinions flip-flop through the episode, with Bender ultimately deciding to kill the master of the hunt right up until the point that he has him in his sights, and then only sparing him to make a point about robot superiority, and then promptly feeling guilt over the unfolding events. People often have a tendency to be much more interested in social issues when they themselves are the one targeted. And this then comes across as confusing to those who can't relate. Because when it's your rights under attack, of course you want to speak up. But someone who is doing fine will continue to do fine, would not care about the message, and more about the way in which the message is sent. It's why Bender doesn't care about the haughty, stuck-up personality of Patrick Stewart, I mean, the master of the hunt, until he's no longer on the bot's side. This isn't a double standard, merely self-interest. Viva Mars Vegas Planet Express goes to Mars Vegas, getting a tour of the casino from Amy's parents while leaving Zoidberg at home due to him being irresponsible with his money. But when the robot mafia drops off their money from a heist in his dumpster, he takes it to Vegas and spends it all in a single night. Later, when the mob wants their money back, he inks them to escape and goes to Planet Express for help. The professor has a device that will turn ink invisible and uses it to cloak Zoidberg, getting away from the mob. But later, when the mob arrives at the casino where Zoidberg lost the money, they decide to take it over by force, leaving Amy and her parents without a penny to their name. So Amy hatches a plan to exploit Zoidberg's invisibility and her knowledge of the casino to sneak into the bank's vault, using rotten shrimp as a cover for Zoidberg sneaking in and eating all the cash. With the help of a few distractions, they manage to make it to the front lobby, only for the native Martian security to catch them before they can head out the door. Then, Amy reveals the true point of the heist. She wanted Zoidberg to steal the deed to the casino that reveals that her family's ownership was only meant to be temporary. The robot mafia demands that the security throws out the illegal occupiers, and they drag the mob away, reclaiming the casino and their land while returning the money to the Wong family. Futurama does a heist movie, complete with playing with the tropes of so many others, such as the point in which Amy announces that she's not going to explain her plan because it won't succeed unless the audience isn't in on the surprise. This ends up being doubled, as the plan goes awry anyway, only for the real, real plan to be revealed. Amy was trying to return the deed to its original owners, an idea she only could have come up with due to spending some time in the employee housing that her parents had forced the Martians onto. Amy begins the episode deriding Zoidberg for his inability to handle money well, saying that he's poor due to being irresponsible and that he can't come on the Vegas trip with the rest of them because of this. Later, she chides him for continuously gambling away all of his money, as it's a bad financial decision to do so, rather than setting some aside as the sensible thing to do. But by the end of the episode, Amy's finally able to get the family's casino away from the robot mafia, only to then throw the fortune away in the interest of doing what she felt was right. Just as Zoidberg has a right to waste his money however he saw fit to do so, and he was still able to find some limited purpose, even while broke. Amy was able to find purpose in her poverty, and wasted a bunch of money at the episode's conclusion even if status quo means that her parents are still obscenely wealthy at the conclusion anyway. Naturama The episode begins as a faux documentary titled Mutual of Omicron's Wild Universe. The first act covers the life cycle of the salmon, with the salmon being represented by various members of the Futurama cast. They start out by swimming downstream, losing a few of their school along the way to waterfalls and predators. Upon arriving at the ocean, the fish begin to mingle, with the fry fish falling for the leela fish as they grow to maturity and prepare to swim back to where they were birthed. 
but Leela lives in a separate stream, and Zap escorts her upstream as Fry watches from one branch over. Ultimately, as the other fish all begin fertilizing, Fry opts to make the leap across the gap in time for Zap to be eaten by a bear, and Fry and Leela are able to die happy. The next act is about the Pinta Island tortoise, a tortoise on the Galapagos Islands who's the last of his kind, seeking a mate he saw on the other side of the island once years ago. The rest of Planet Express joins him on this extraordinarily slow journey until he's finally able to reunite with his old love, who turns out to be a rock. Undeterred, Farnsworth proceeds to attempt to mate with the rock, only for the mom tortoise to arrive and jealously push it off a cliff. The two are able to repopulate the species before dying of old age, assuming a happy ending, in spite of their offsprings falling off the same cliff and getting crushed. The final segment is about the elephant seal, where the group is dominated by a physically powerful alpha male while the remaining males stand aside, alone and unable to mate. But tired of being ignored by society, they encourage a kiff seal to try to seduce Amy anyway by presenting her with a meal of squid, ultimately challenging Bender to a fight where he's gruesomely beaten to a pulp. In the end, Bender reasserts his dominance, only for the next batch of offspring to resemble every man but him, due to the fact that Bender was too busy defending his land to notice the sneaky males. Forty percent lead belly. While dropping off a prisoner, Bender sees a famous folk singer, Silicon Red, and asks him for his guitar so he can become a famous folk singer too. But as the old man refuses to give up something that's been with him for decades, Bender simply has a scientist 3D print a copy of the guitar from his memories. Bender prepares to be famous, only to get booed off stage as he has no authentic experiences to sing about. Then he heads to the railroads to get some. While there, he meets a hard-working robot named Big Caboose and decides to steal that man's life story for his song, with a few embellishments to make it more interesting, such as Bender sleeping with the man's girlfriend before getting run down by a train. After writing this song, the real Big Caboose starts chasing Bender with the train, and Fry refuses to shelter his old friend in their apartment as he's still mad about being abandoned at the prison at the start of the episode. When Bender flees to Planet Express, he finds Fry there as well, learning that he's still connected to the 3D printer which is creating real versions of everything he's singing about. Realizing he's doomed, Fry and Leela suggest that he simply write an ending to the song that will get him out of trouble, but Bender has too much artistic integrity to cop out like that and ends up killed, only to reveal that the Bender with integrity was a fake and the real Bender had made a copy of himself with too much integrity to refuse to die for his art. Folk music, like all creative endeavors, is something that requires a lot of what's often referred to as soul to be considered good. Soul in this sense usually refers to a touch of unique experience that is at once personal and universal. As this experience is shared with a general audience, people feel a connection to the person singing and feel an elevated connection not just to the song but the world in general, as such personality is revealed to be universal. That is to say, the art reflects both the audience and the artist. But Bender's desire to become a famous folk singer isn't born out of a sense of hoping to put some part of himself out there so strangers can make a connection, but because he wants fame and admiration. There's no soul in his music, so he goes out to find someone else's. Ironically, all the soul he steals from the rest of the world winds up being projections of his own mind, meaning that the real music was within him all along. But rather than taking that message away, Bender decides he doesn't actually want to relate to other people if it means he has to expose himself emotionally so he creates a version of him who isn't a sellout and has the integrity in his body to die out instead. Two D Blacktop The Professor and Leela argue over the Professor's modifications to the ship, constantly making it faster and fancier, but ignoring the safety concerns of the actual crew. When it's destroyed and sent to a scrapyard, the professor breaks into that yard to repair his ship with even fewer safety regulations on it, while Leela buys a gray cube that she claims is far safer than the old ship. The professor ends up getting into a street race with a gang of racers who offer to let him into their gang when he shows off his multi-dimensional drifting. When this gang comes across Leela's new ship, they make fun of it as it's far too safe and boring, prompting Leela to challenge him to a Mobius street race. Leela is about to win before the Professor activates the drift, causing the ships to collide and smoosh Fry, Leela, Bender, and the Professor into the second dimension. 
Once there, they get invited to a feast at the castle of the 2D king, only to be driven out when the professor tries to explain the third dimension to them. They take the faster ship out of the dimension, engaging the drift once again and reappearing just before their old 3D versions are killed, exiting back to New New York and riding off into the sunset. The professor and Leela feud in this episode over the conflict of safety versus speed. The professor's ship is faster, but much more dangerous and less tested, even getting the crew teleported to a bizarre dimension due to an unforeseen circumstance. Leela's ideal ship, on the other hand, errs on the opposite end of the spectrum, so safe that it doesn't even allow the opportunity to make errors, auto-delivering the package and reducing the agency of the crew. Of course, this conflict is just an expansion of the deeper conflicts between the two. The professor, as the one who owns the business, wants the ship to go as fast as possible to make deliveries efficiently. But Leela, the one who actually does the deliveries, is concerned for her safety more so than the professor's bottom line. And then the rest of the episode is just a series of references with little affection or coherence to one another. The first two acts revolve around street racing, making fun of various concepts and the contrived ways in which these concepts often feel crammed into other movies. And the final act involves the characters entering a gimmicky world, with a handful of jokes about the differences in perspective between the characters and audience that wear out just in time for the episode to abruptly end. T. The Terrestrial. Hoping to get a merit badge, Lur, ruler of the planet Omicron Percy I-8, takes his son out to conquer a defenseless planet, Earth. While conquering the planet, Jur, his son, kills one of the Agnew clones and Nixon reacts by putting an embargo on the other planet. This happens just as the professor runs out of his arthritis cream, the main ingredient of which is only found on Omicron Percy I-8, so the crew has to sneak onto the planet to harvest some. But when the Omicronians nearly catch them in the act, Fry gets left behind. He gets discovered by Jur, who takes him in as a pet in secret. But Lur discovers Fry and forces Jur to kill him, which Jur refuses to do, only for Fry to die of malnutrition anyway. But just after dying, he's brought back by the plants he's ingested, reacting with Vinder's electromagneticism. As Vinder eventually felt guilty enough to save Fry after a week of using their answering machine to make it appear as though Fry is simply busy and the two return home, where Fry is confused about his hero's welcome. Futurama has always been a show willing to affectionately poke fun at various sci-fi tropes and storylines, and this is an episode where they take a shot at sci-fi adjacent movies. It flips the usual dynamic, with Fry being the alien, while the alien character is the human from the E.T. story. Ideally, this would be a means of letting the story be told through an alternate lens, but it ends up being a missed opportunity as the basic tropes are played straight. Fry gets reduced to a very basic set of comic relief tropes, while the focus of the episode is instead on Jur, someone who's just been introduced. But back onto the subject of sci-fi parody, this episode's plot doesn't really make sense, and then makes jokes about not making sense as though that makes it okay. Fry is brought back from the dead by a poorly explained concept, effectively identical to magic, the sort of lazy writing many weaker science fiction stories often rely on as a crutch. But as this is an episode with very little else going for it, it hardly makes itself seem better than that which it's making fun of. Fry and Leela's Big Fling Fry and Leela attempt to go on a date, but can't find anywhere to be alone together until a targeted advertisement on Leela's wrist informs them of a fully automated resort, where they can be entirely alone. The two head out while the rest of the crew goes to the planet Simeon 7, a planet of the apes where humans are not allowed, and they drop off a delivery of classic cars with Amy wearing marmoset pajamas to blend in. They receive a tour of the planet from Gunther, Fry's college roommate, and he shows them a museum with various exhibits, including an exhibit that shows Fry and Leela's date. As it turns out, the resort they went to had a series of contrivances to include Leela's ex-boyfriend Sean, who, alongside his current wife, was trapped on the island due to manufactured mechanical failures, and his presence caused Fry to grow jealous and argue with Leela. The Planet Express crew are upset about their friends being exhibited in a zoo and demand to speak to the manager, who turns out to be Dr. Banjo. He shows them footage of Fry and Leela insulting their friends, but Amy and the rest decide to rescue them anyway only to be eaten by a sandworm as they spend the next week being digested while Fry and Leela finish up their vacation. A lot of TV shows with romantic elements will play up plots involving jealousy from the presence of ex-lovers, having one character suddenly feel retroactively betrayed by their partner's history. 
Generally, this is the type of plot that's derived, both in fiction and real life, by one person's feelings of inadequacy. That the idea of any competition to their romance is terrifying, as they feel like they would get second place in a competition between two people. But these plots are often very contrived as well, two characters who are in love suddenly deciding against the judgment that piloted their feelings for so long, or rather, one character interprets the events this way. And so what better way to show off the personality contrivances than to literally have them be an in-universe contrivance? Fry and Leela's relationship spat is really just an invention by the apes, who are using them as a zoo exhibit, watching the two argue the way people might watch the same story play out on television. And in keeping with the tone of this, the episode reveals that there was no real threat or danger in the end. Just because Fry and Leela are unknowingly in a museum doesn't actually imply danger, just as two characters in a TV show are guaranteed to resolve their dispute in the interest of maintaining status quo. The Inhuman Torch Zap's ineptitude causes a collapse in a helium mine on the sun, and Planet Express is sent to fix it. Bender tries to avoid doing any actual work, but inadvertently launches himself deeper into the mine, rescuing a miner by accident. When he sees the amount of praise he's getting for the rescue, he saves the rest of them, getting a medal from the mayor and earning Planet Express the right to serve as the new firefighting team for new New York City. They put out a series of fires, but Bender gets most of the credit, until the rest of the crew eventually deduces that all the fires started near places Bender usually visits. They accuse him of starting all the fires and kick him out of the firefighters, but while leaving, Bender finds a sentient solar flare that attached itself to him back on the sun, the one responsible for lighting all the fires, and the solar flare declares its intentions to turn the Earth into a second sun. So Bender goes to the Arctic Ocean to make sure the fire can't burn anything ever again. Fry finds Bender's destroyed metal and concludes that Bender couldn't have started the fires as he would never destroy something valuable that belonged to him. But when he hears the true story from Bender, he doesn't believe it. The fire then attaches itself to Fry and follows him home, so Bender chases after it, eventually fighting it in the basement of Planet Express before the two other solar flares thank him for his heroism, even though no one will ever believe him. Bender usually gets away with his crime sprees during the show, so this episode inverts the usual dynamic by having him be accused of something he didn't do, simply because it seems like it's something that he would. It's a situation where Bender is punished not for his actions, but the intention behind them. He puts out fires, not because he cares about saving lives, but because he enjoys the hero worship. But it's not as though Bender is entirely innocent anyway. The very reason he's spreading so many fires in the first place was due to the fact that he caught a solar flare during a rescue mission that he tried to flake on, and then only got involved with because of his ego. Fry, on the other hand, has the inverse experience of Bender. He was making a genuine effort to save lives, but wound up overlooked, eventually falling in with the rest of Planet Express when they started to falsely accuse Bender of starting fires around the city. Fry ultimately winds up being the one to take the blame for starting the fire after Bender is exonerated. Fry being punished not because he actually did anything wrong, but because he didn't believe Bender when he said the truth. And it's also worth pointing out that the only reason the fire at Planet Express happened was because Fry didn't trust Bender's word, leaving him open to be exploited by the solar flare in the first place. Saturday Morning Fun Pit President Nixon sits down on a Saturday morning to watch some cartoons. First, he watches Bindi Boo and the Mystery Crew, a series about XBs of Scooby-Doo driving to Farnsworth's to spend the night in his illegal cloning facility. First, they stop by a closed-down kabuki theater run by George Takei, where he explains that no one goes to the theater anymore due to the new basketball stadium. That new stadium is being played in by the Harlem Globetrotters, who have made five clones of Larry Bird to practice against. After setting a dragon trap to capture a ghost nearby, they finally catch the ghost, only for it to be revealed as George Takei, who's been haunting the stadium not to get more business, but because he's mentally ill. Afterwards, an angry mob demands that children's programming be less crass, promoting healthy eating and strong morals. The result is an 80s-style commercial show called Purpleberry Pond, where the Planet Express crew are playing the roles of cartoon characters who live in a fantasy land and talk about how great their cereal is, so kids at home will tell their parents to buy it. Finally, once people complain about the violent content of cartoons, Nixon decides to use his editing equipment to retouch an episode of G.I. Zap about the team of mercenaries fighting against Acronym. 
He goes through, redumbing the fight scenes to imply that all the brutal killing is actually just water balloon fights and other innocent fun. But once Bender starts hacking away at faceless mooks with a chainsaw, he decides to instead simply cut to the PSA, where Agnew tears up a children's toy to stop kids from arguing. Calculon 2.0 Bender and Fry are grieving the death of Calculon as well as the fact that their favorite show, All My Circuits, is no longer good without the actor. So with the professor's help, they dig up his corpse and negotiate with the robot devil to get his soul from robot hell, eventually performing a science that resurrects his body. Calculon then returns to his old set to get his job back, but the executives in charge shoot down his offer, saying that he's far too washed up to act anymore due to the hamminess of his old performances now being out of date. Deterred by the fact that he's not a big thing, Calculon starts to mope, packing up all his things to live in obscurity as Leela's been suggesting since the start of his second chance. But he's so forlorn about losing his career, Leela's convinced that he might actually be able to do a reserved performance after all, bringing his acting back to All My Circuits in disguise and getting the part of the resurrected Calculon. He struggles at first, as his ego returns and makes it difficult to be understated, until Leela demotivates him once more, with Calculon doing such a great job of his new performance that he receives a standing ovation and then it's promptly crushed by a falling set. In the end, Calculon returns to Robot Hell, happy he was able to get a second chance after all. Calculon makes an attempt at salvaging a dead career that was killed by his, well, his death. But even prior to that, he was already fading out of relevance, losing an acting duel to another man while starring in a trashy soap opera. In reality, the biggest thing killing his career was his lack of adaptation, Though Calculon was a big star in his day and only lost his performance due to the fact that he remained stagnant, his overacting being a symptom of an earlier time when that was considered normal. As the world has moved on from over-the-top hamminess and towards more subtlety, Calculon has been left behind, as he's not only incapable of internal change, but in changing his perception to the minds of his viewers. Calculon will always be considered old school, even when he's not. But Calculon is still able to find some success despite this by channeling his personal experience into his career, getting some relatability out of being left behind, able to appeal to the older demographic who grew up with him, feeling the same way. Or something like that. Calculon dies at the end of the episode, the only thing he leaves behind being a greater legacy, something that will truly immortalize him not as a relic of a specific age of cinema, but as an actor. Assy Come Home Planet Express delivers a shipment to a gang-infested planet that Leela discovers is full of firearms. She orders Bender to destroy them, only for the guns to be revealed as a peace offering between the two gangs that winds up destroying all of them. They rush back to the ship, only to learn that, as they were gone, Bender was stolen, save for his eyes and mouth. They track his last location to a robot chop shop and receive a list of where each part was sold to, flying around the galaxy to retrieve each Bender bit one by one, until they only have a single piece remaining, Bender's shiny metal ass. This is revealed to have been on board a ship that sank in the Sargasso galaxy, so Leela, Fry, and Bender set out to retrieve it, with the assistance of the lighthouse keeper, whose lighthouse cannot penetrate the thick fog surrounding the asteroid. But after they retrieve it with the bathysphere, they plan on reattaching it only for Bender's ass to be revealed as the perfect surface for the lighthouse's light. He reluctantly parts with it in the interest of saving sailors' lives, but after moping back in Planet Express, the ass returns home, having grown sick of the Lighthouse Keeper's Bible stories. A heartfelt tale about Bender going to extreme lengths to retrieve and then part with his shiny metal ass. Or at least, that's what the episode portrays itself as. At a point, one starts to wonder just how much of an attachment the audience is supposed to feel to objects that the cast relates to instead of what those objects mean to the viewers. Binter's shiny metal ass is a part of one of his main catchphrases, but this catchphrase's popularity may have been confused for a close emotional attachment. This episode is largely a series of set pieces where the Planet Express crew travels the galaxy in search of parts of a robot that's always been viewed as semi-replaceable, all to assuage the ego of a character who's more or less a villain alongside his friends. So the second and third act of this episode ends up at odds with one another, establishing a series of comedic beats, only to make it appear as though those beats meant more. This is a similar structure to an episode like Jurassic Park, where the audience spends a few minutes getting to see the relationship between Fry and Seymour built upon, so the impact of the end of the episode works. 
but out of real relationships to scrape off the bottom of the idea barrel, we get an episode where the audience is intended to feel close to Bender's big butt. Leela and the Jeans Dulk while at a southern bar, Leela finds out she's unable to let go of the mechanical buggy, and Zoidberg identifies why. She's developing small suction cups on her hands due to her mutant DNA. She frets over this condition, so the rest of Planet Express agrees to sell the ship in order to pay for an operation that will delay the symptoms for a few months. But Fry purchases magic beans instead. These beans later grow into a massive beanstalk that reaches the sky, and Leela decides to climb to the top instead of fleeing to live in the sewers as a mutant. But once up there, she finds a castle in the clouds run by Mom, a genetic engineering lab that has been producing the giant beans Fry bought. Fry and Bender, upon learning that Leela's not actually in the sewers, head up to the clouds to track Leela down and break her out of captivity. While escaping, they free a giant from captivity and eventually confront Mom, crashing her ship into New New York to stop the experiments. But after landing, Mom reveals that she's managed to breed a fast-growing, durable beanstalk out of Leela's DNA, and convinces Leela to give up her anti-GMO crusade by offering to undo the mutation. The antagonist of this episode is initially played up to be Mom, who's been experimenting with genetic modifications in a scary-looking lab, capturing Leela after she intrudes on the castle grounds and using her DNA with the nefarious goal of making a fast-growing sturdy plant that can feed millions of people and curing gigantism. GMOs tend to have a very bad reputation due to the companies that grow them, making attempts to do things such as patenting specific genomes and punishing farmers with fields adjacent to their own when the plants crossbreed. The reality, though, is that genetic engineering is essentially just an acceleration of the tens of thousands of years old human activity of replanting the hottest peppers and biggest potatoes. It's unequivocally good science that happens to have been co-opted by greed. On the character side, this episode shows the split between the way that Fry and Leela view Leela's appearance. Fry repeatedly states that, no matter how much Leela's appearance makes him recoil in fear, he still loves her for her behavior and personality. But it's Leela who's conscious of her appearance, not in the context of her fear that Fry won't find her attractive, but in the sense that she herself won't. It's one thing to have a partner who finds you attractive, it's another thing entirely to find yourself worthy of that praise, lest it come across as insincere. Game of Tones A mysterious alien ship has been flying around the universe, blasting different planets with four musical notes before destroying them. These tones start to reach Earth, causing people to panic over the unknown nature. But Fry seems to remember where they came from, with the professor scanning his brain to identify when in his memory he heard them, December 31st, 1999, the day he was frozen. To awaken the memory, Planet Express has Fry go into a dreamlike state that allows him to relive his last day in the 20th century. He wanders around in his dream, trying to figure out where he heard the notes before, but eventually winds up distracted by trying to spend time with his family for the first time in thousands of years. But the rest of Planet Express, concerned with how long the process is taking, enter his dream and force him to start remembering more winding up at the exact moment where Fry's about to be frozen, when he hears the tones once again, as well as two other notes. Back in the future, Fry responds to the alien ship's tones with what they've theorized as the proper response, and the ship lands to reveal that it's another Niblonian, the tone simply being the noise produced by his key fob as he forgot where he parked after dropping Nibbler off at the start of the 21st century. For helping them locate their ship, Fry is rewarded with the ability to enter the dreams his mother had of him after his disappearance. A heartfelt story about Fry finally getting the chance to spend some time with his mom a thousand years after the last time he saw her. The fact that he briefly gets a chance to remember what he lost and then loses it again spurs him to suddenly care about a character who, up to this point, practically did not exist. Fry's mom is such a non-character up to this point that I challenge you right now to try to tell me her name. What to call her other than Fry's mom. This episode winds up with all the trappings of Futurama's very best, using what's established about the characters to set up larger emotionally driven plots that has an ending meant to make the viewer feel all tingly inside. But this episode is not about some grand conspiracy foreshadowed from the very beginning of the show that winds up explaining so much backstory, but is instead about a Niblonian who we just met trying to find his spaceship after he lost it. And the emotional conclusion of the episode is merely about Fry trying to reconnect with someone who's never shown any inclination towards wanting to be reconnected to. 
And while someone like Seymour can break our hearts in the same episode where we meet him, for with Fry's mom, who does not actually have a given name in the show, the viewer themselves is expected to do most of the emotional legwork. Murder on the Planet Express Everybody at Planet Express starts to mistrust each other as accusations fly about various oddities around the office. So they all set up hidden cameras to catch the person they're accusing in the act, only to learn that it was someone else after all. When these exonerations don't actually prevent argument, the professor feels forced to make everyone go on a company team-building exercise. The hired business consultant, Dan McMasters, tries to prove he can trust people by picking up a random hitchhiker, who turns out to be a shape-shifting alien who eats him. The rest of the crew hides from the monster in the panic room, where they plan to head out in pairs to fix various damaged parts of the ship. Fry and Bender work together to offset Bender's damaged gyroscope and Fry's missing magnetic boots. Amy and Leela are assaulted by the monster but fight it off together. And Zoidberg even saves Hermes' life. After making their peace with one another and returning to the panic room, the professor reveals there was no danger as the shapeshifter was part of a team-building exercise. And then he shapeshifts and starts to eat people himself. They wander around the ship, getting killed off one by one, until Fry and Bender are alone, where they apologize for their earlier accusations, before McMasters enters and says the whole thing was a test all along, and then the paranoid duo shoots him to dust. At the end of the episode, Fry and Bender learn that the entire ordeal was a fabrication of the team-building organization, and they were never in any real danger. But afterwards, they learn that the man they killed together has a reward for information on his killer, and the two are implied to fight over who gets to report whom. This is shortly after the two have made a secret pact never to tell anyone about what they did. Fry and Bender, as well as the rest of the crew on Planet Express, were all put under an extremely stressful situation and were able to come out closer as a result. But as soon as they're out of that situation, the newfound companionships are all but gone. Bonds formed under stress tend to only hold up under stress, just as much as bonds formed in good times tend to collapse under stress. And what's more stressful than a recreation of The Thing? A shapeshifter threatens the crew, causing everyone to turn on one another, as they become unable to identify who's real and who's not. And while the answer of realness tends to be found in whoever happens to be saving the life of the person attempting to answer that question, their other attempts prove useless, like Fry and Bender not knowing each other enough to come up with something both of them would have the same answer to. Stench and Stenchability Zoidberg meets up with an alien he's been distance dating for years, only for that alien to become so disgusted with his smell that she leaves him. Distraught, he attempts to return flowers to the booth where he bought them, only to end up using that stench to save the owner, Marianne, from a mugging. As it turns out, Marianne has no sense of smell, and she's smitten with the stinky doctor. But when the rest of Planet Express discovers the relationship, they inform Zoidberg that he could easily perform a nose transplant that would give Marianne her ability to smell. He's distraught over whether or not to teach her about this until eventually Zoidberg gives in, upset about saying the various things she can't smell. He performs the surgery himself, aware that she'll be disgusted with him once she has her sense of smell. But instead of this coming true, she reveals that she doesn't know a good smell from a bad one, and finds Zoidberg's stench acceptable. Meanwhile, Binder enters a local tap dancing competition, making it to the finals where he plans on sabotaging his opponent, a young girl with a heart condition only for her to break his kneecaps before he gets the chance to. She winds up winning the tap dance off, but has a heart attack from the excitement. Bender celebrates his win by dancing on the girl's corpse, only for his tap dancing to restart her heart, and the two decide to use their tap dancing skills for evil, together. There's no accounting for taste, unless you want to fit in with everyone else. Marianne has never had a sense of smell, and thus has no way of gauging what a good or bad one is, and no way of being influenced by other people's taste. As long as one doesn't have a person influencing their opinions, it's easy to find something pleasant that others might find unpalatable. And while smell is generally less ambiguous in terms of good or bad, smell after all is a human sense meant to identify spoiled food, the associations one has in their head with certain scents will change from person to person. It's like somebody who thinks the beach smells like an enjoyable vacation, while another might think it smells like dead fish. And once you shed the initial impressions that social norms place onto you, you are truly able to start to form opinions for yourself. Many people will make the claim that they're an independent thinker, but still only make their opinions based off partial information, like a person judging light based off who's casting a shadow. 
So real independent thinking comes from being able to form your own first impression, instead of being put off by somebody due to what others tell you you ought to already know. Meanwhile. Fry and Leela go to the moon park they visited for their first delivery, where an accident on one of the rides launches Leela outside the air dome where she is nearly killed. Realizing that life is short, Fry decides to propose to her, right around the time that the professor unveils his new machine, a time button that can send the user 10 seconds back in time. Fry steals the button and uses it to prepare everything for his proposal to Leela, but when she doesn't arrive at their meeting point on the roof of New New York's tallest building, he decides to jump off. But as it turns out, Leela was on time, and Fry's watch was fast due to repeated use. So he goes back in time 10 seconds, only to realize that he had been falling for more than 10 seconds. As the button takes 10 seconds to recharge, Fry cannot escape the time loop of falling forever. But the professor and the rest of Planet Express discover that the time button's theft, and head out to use the professor's time shelter to stop it, going to the tower where they make a plan to stop Fry from falling. Bender's airbag saves him, but not before the button is destroyed, freezing Fry and Leela in time. With no way to fix the button, they simply spend the rest of eternity with one another, leading full lives and growing old together. But when they're both elderly, the professor appears, after having been torn apart by a time reset occurring outside the shelter. He fixes the button and offers to rewind them back to the place they were, before the professor ever invented the button, and Fry and Leela declare their intentions to grow old all over again. The real, final, actual, ultimate finale of Futurama. Until it wasn't. By this point, Futurama has been taken off the air, or has risked being taken off the air so many times, that it practically feels like reliving that same moment again and again. So what better way to satirize the cyclicality of it all by making a finale that continuously relives itself again and again? Futurama had concluded on a similar note so many times before, that it almost feels like it's not worthwhile to bother bringing it back, just to suffer the same fate. Almost. This episode draws a comparison between Fry and Leela's relationship and the way in which we engage with media in general. The couple is able to live a long, happy life together as they grow old at each other's sides, and then they get the chance to do it all over again, a chance they readily jump at. Just because something has a foregone conclusion doesn't mean that the journey to that conclusion isn't worth visiting. Reading a good book, even though you know the ending, doesn't make the experience any worse. In fact, the ability to better appreciate foreshadowing might even make the story more appealing. And just because we know that Fry and Leela will live happily together after all, doesn't mean that the lives they're going to live are unworthy of observation. Futurama may have a predictable ending again and again, but the destination is nowhere near as important as the journey. Simpson O Rama Springfield Elementary buries a time capsule to be dug up after 1,000 years. Bart, having forgotten his homework, puts his lunch inside after blowing his nose in it. Later that night, something falls from the sky and crawls into the Simpson family's basement, later investigated to be Bender. Bender explains that he's a robot from the future, although he doesn't remember why he was sent back in time. So Lisa takes him to Professor Frank, who turns him off and back on again, and then Bender remembers he is supposed to kill Homer Simpson. But as Homer and Bender had spent some time bonding with one another, Bender can't bring himself to do it. So the rest of Planet Express goes back to reveal why his mission was important. The future has been overrun by creatures who mutated from Simpson DNA in the time capsule. The Professor, Frank, and Lisa deduce that they don't actually have to kill a Simpson to prevent this, but that they simply need to dig up the time capsule. However, before they get the chance to do so, the creatures in the future destroy the time machine, sending everyone but Bender and Maggie into the future. Wanting to get back to her child, Marge encourages everyone to come up with a solution, rounding up the creatures and launching them all into space. Homer and Fry manage to fix the time machine, and everyone goes back through Bender to get to their regular era, with Bender simply shutting himself off for 1,000 years to return to his time the old-fashioned way. In the end, the creatures wind up landing on Omicron per CI-8, just in time for a visit from Kang and Kodos. Two long-running shows with ever-expanding casts and worlds are crossed over, and like with most crossover episodes, the script winds up packed with far too much for any one story to have enough emphasis to justify itself. The episode even pokes fun at this phenomenon, with someone like Zoidberg appearing for a single line and ceasing to be relevant after delivering it. 
Unfortunately, so many other characters wind up going down the same spiral of irrelevance as well, characters that ostensibly are supposed to be important to the cast. So what this episode ends up doing outside of being a very simple gimmick is by trying to capture the spirit of each show at once. And yet Futurama was a show that was initially conceived as a way to reject the tropes that The Simpsons had been reduced to, a way to create something outside of the shadow of its predecessor. So what ends up happening instead are two shows who seem to be at odds with one another, as though not even the characters themselves want to be there. Outro Most critics reviewing the second life of Futurama came to a similar conclusion, that the show still had plenty of great moments, but was far from living up to the standards of the classic seasons of 1 through 4. That is to say, the good episodes of Futurama were just as good as always, while the bad episodes were worse. Though the show averaged out as a lesser revival than usual, but not a revival without some merit on its own. One can still enjoy the show for individual gags and plot lines, and even some of the more critically panned stories still found fans eager for a rewatch. And rewatchability is what keeps a show in the modern consciousness. As of the release of this video, Futurama has been renewed again, and it's between seasons again. And of course, the only reason it was renewed, besides a general risk aversion by producers forcing them to stick to established franchises, is because Futurama does not lose fans. People who enjoyed the show came back to it again and again, and the current owner of the streaming rights will always find a consistent audience with Futurama. So while one could say that the show being cancelled means that the show is dead, the reality is that it's merely hibernating. No new episodes were produced for nearly a decade, but that doesn't actually mean that Futurama has stopped existing in the consciousness of people. Just as the inspirations for Futurama continue to influence the show's writers for decades after being taken off the air. And with that precedent in mind, Futurama will likewise continue to influence future creatives for decades, or even millennia, to come.